What does P. Diddy have to do with us and our regular lives? I saw a comment that I think solidified my thoughts perfectly, which is uh, something to the effect of, I'm never complaining about my nine to five job again because I'd rather have that life than this one. And I think when you look around the world and you think to yourself, man, I really wish that was my life. Do you? Do you? Now, there are certain aspects in life where you think, man, I really wish I was in better shape. As a goal, that's reasonable. I want to get into better shape. But to be envious, to be jealous, you know what I mean? To want something that other people have without understanding the consequences of wanting it. When I was young, I wanted to be one of those Nickelodeon kids. And my mom said, I'm not putting you in Hollywood. I'm not doing that. All those people are perverts. And they're, they're doing bad things to those kids. I just know it. And I said, mom, you're crazy. This is, that's crazy. And I'm 35 in May. So just around the corner. And that was when I was what, like 12? And my mom knew. And she would tell me, no, Batty, you cannot do this. And I would say, why not? All my friends are doing it. They're auditioning. I want to audition. And my mom knew deep down in her mom gut that something was going on with those kids. And now in 2024, we're finally all seeing the documentaries. We're finally spilling the tea. It's finally becoming a real thing and not just a conspiracy theory of some religious mom who homeschooled her kids. And it makes me put my mom into a different framework, like her perspective. It makes me realize like as much as I doubted my mother, she even predicted Weinstein. My mom would tell me these actresses, they don't want to be naked doing sex scenes, Betsy. They just trick you into thinking they feel liberated. And I was like, no, there's no way. And now every single woman coming out and complaining about Weinstein and everything they had to do to keep their movie roles, I'm like, holy crap. How did my mom know this? Well, it started with her knowledge on Shirley Temple, which you guys have heard me tell the story before. But my mom and I used to watch Shirley Temple my whole life growing up. And she would say, I wish someone protected Shirley Temple better. I wish her mom got her out of Hollywood quicker. But when Shirley Temple was getting older, they offered her movie roles, but she had to be naked. And basically the story goes depending on which bubble you're in that Shirley like rejected it and knew the Hollywood execs wanted something from her she wasn't willing to give up. There's even a story she tells in an interview later in life where the executive separates her mother and her from one another and gets naked in front of Shirley Temple. And Shirley laughs in his face, which the exec is offended by and kicks her out as a kid. Now, do you know that when I was traveling in Alabama, Montgomery, Alabama, I went to the Fitzgerald's home which was a museum curated by this woman who was really lovely. And when I was there, she had letters written from Fitzgerald to Hemingway to all these people. It was Zelda Fitzgerald's father's home. And one of the letters was to Fitzgerald and it was to Shirley Temple. He said, I'm getting out of Hollywood, baby. They're all crazy here. And I hope you get out too. Something like that. I'm probably paraphrasing it. And I remember seeing that. I wish I took a picture of it. And I remember thinking, oh, my mom knew. And Fitzgerald was warning Shirley. And now we have all this documentation from these people who just lived a few years ago, realistically. Okay, not too long ago. Trying to warn us right now about the same Hollywood we're dealing with right now. Hollywood, the music industry, police industries, military. <laughs> all these big communities of people, they are not without sin, in quotation marks. So... Now we come to the modern day and we come to P. Diddy. A music mogul, everybody knows P. Diddy. Kesha wakes up every day feeling like him. That's a joke. And P. Diddy doesn't just have one or two or three people accusing him of things. He's got so many stories. Cassie being one of the most prevalent in recent ones that people remember because she just came out with her story. But just a reminder and maybe this is just me, but I've been in the like rap slash multitude of American black bubbles for a really long time in terms of like my interest in those bubbles because I like the music and I'm interested in people. And I remember Meek Mill and Nicki Minaj having their falling out over their relationship. And I remember Meek putting out secret messages and Nicki mentioning things that make that makes me now in hindsight I'm like oh my god it was about Diddy like I'm like oh this is all about Diddy and this makes a lot more sense now now I could be wrong technically I could be wrong wrong 
Um, but I'm pretty sure we're about to see some interesting information about Meek Mill and everybody else involved. Now, I had asked myself, how do certain people get famous? Why do certain people reach the top? And truthfully, it's because some people sleep their way to the top. Some people are raped their way to the top. Some people are sex trafficked their way to the top. And it's really interesting when you start learning about people like Jay-Z and Beyonce and you learn that he was 30 and she was 18 when they got together. When you learn about R. Kelly, you learn about the music industry and you realize, oh, it's not that different from Hollywood. And we've all been so distracted with Michael Jackson stories, we forgot he was also a victim as a child of the music industry. And we forget that Michael was never the king of predators. He was the victim of one. And he might have been a predator, right? There's a lot of documentaries about that too. And I wouldn't be surprised if he continued the cycle. Because as we're about to watch these videos now, there are a lot of rumors and allegations of Usher being a victim of P. Diddy and continuing the cycle with Justin Bieber. There's so much to be said about hurt people hurt people. But more than that, what does this mean for you and me? So I was thinking about this, like, what does it mean for you and me? It means that we have an opportunity to actually decide, is this what we want? Is this the life we want to be envious of? Or do we want to be thoughtful and introspective about how to maintain our joy outside of the illusion of this perfect, wonderful, materialistic life they're selling us? And then if you see them doing this, if you see Andrew Tate and P. Diddy and Weinstein and Cosby and all of these people over and over and over again getting caught, and you still think to yourself, but I'm going to be the good version of them, ask yourself if that even exists. And then if you tell yourself, like, I still want to be like them, ask yourself what that means, right? Okay, who girl. <clears throat> so just a reminder. The singer Cassie, Combs' former romantic partner, according to NBC News, shocked many in November when she filed a civil suit against Combs, alleging that the musical mogul smexually and physically abused her during the course of their relationship. Guys, like the stream. I'm going to try to censor my words, but I'm probably going to get demonetized. My last few videos got somewhat monetized just because I was dealing with grape stories. She filed her case on November 19th, <coughs> I'm sorry, November 16th under New York State's Adult Survivors Act, which gave adult victims of sexual violence a one-year window to file civil claims regarding, regardless of statute of limitations. In the suit, Cassie alleged that Combs raped her, beat her in fits of uncontrollable rage, and exerted a tight hold over her life. She alleged that he would force her to engage in smex acts he called freak-offs with other men, often smex workers, whom he'd pay to travel with them while he watched. The abuse ranged from 2007 until Cassie left him in late 2018. Combs vehemently denied the allegations from Cassie, whose name is Cassandra Ventura. They settled the suit a day after it was filed. Okay, so she settled, which makes sense. It's probably one of the best ways to go about it. What's really interesting, and I think will, will be interesting, is when we're having this discussion, there's obviously a difference between somebody with an insane amount of power orchestrating an insane system that allows victims to be created and maintained and convinced that they belong there versus, you know, people drunk at a party who mistook physical uh, communications and made a mistake. Now, there's a spectrum. When I mentioned Andrew Huberman the other day, and then I mentioned it in relation to D. P D, D Pity, <laughs> P. Diddy, People were like, are you saying Andrew Huberman is like P. Diddy? I'm saying on a spectrum, they're all violations of consent. The question is, when do we decide it's bad? So let's do a little test for ourselves, okay? This is like a test I was trying to give myself today. Why do I draw the line in certain places? So I think cheating on your partner is a consent violation. And it's one in which I think is unacceptable, right? And I think that that, that is very bad according to my values. Is it anywhere near sex trafficking someone, smex trafficking someone? Is it anywhere near that? Not necessarily. Depends. Because cheating in our heads means something. So I imagine you're in a monogamous relationship and you're sleeping with somebody else and you don't tell your partner and then they find out. But it could also mean giving your partner an uncurable STI impregnating them against their will, 
um, sodomizing them to the point of like physical destruction, putting them in the hospital, um, you know, because you're violating their consent or maybe the other person you're violating with is like, or maybe you're cheating on your partner. Anyways, I'm sorry. I'm like thinking about all these different things now. It doesn't usually, sorry. What I said doesn't usually relate to like cheating, but the consent violation, right? So when I think about what things could mean, I think about all the details that could coincide with it, but we don't know what we're talking about. So is cheating just as bad as sex trafficking? Like, no, but also like, what does it mean? Because like, you can cheat and sex traffic people. They're just different kinds of immoral acts, in my opinion. Okay, so what's worse, right? Cheating with multiple people and spreading STIs around or sex trafficking? Is sex trafficking adults better than sex trafficking children? How about if you just, like, what if it's just pictures? Or what if it's just, like, convincing people to sign contracts that are legal, but you coerce them to do it? What if you got them drunk first? What if what if you just gave them enough money to say yes, even though they didn't want to do it, but you didn't drug them, you didn't coerce them other than offering them a lot of money and then they made the decision? It's like, in what way are you going into this conversation? And it's about that good faith, bad faith. If you go into a conversation wanting to manipulate, coerce, or change someone's mind so you benefit and you don't care if they do, but you convince them, oh, it's a, it's a symbiotic relationship, you'll benefit and I'll benefit, I think that's like bad faith. If you go into a situation hoping to convince somebody to do something against their better health, joy, and says Brittany giving people ideas, stop it. No, canceled. Okay, if you go into a situation, right, hoping, or no, if you go into a situation not caring about the other person, past them speaking highly of you, which I think Diddy does a lot, are you a good person? Is that good? Right? It sounds like Andrew Tate. Andrew Tate does this thing where he convinces people through lies and deception, according to his own words, that he's on their side and he's absolutely like there for them. But secretly behind closed doors is making fun of them, being destructive towards them, fucking them up in the long run. And he sees himself as a good person and then people look at him and see him as a good person. I think it's a red flag if you're a fan of Andrew Tate, if you know everything that's been going on. Lots of people are a fan of Andrew Tate and have no idea what's going on. But if you know everything that's going on about Andrew Tate, and I mean like everything, because there's so much people don't know, then it's it kind of says a lot about you, right? And I think there's something about P. Diddy in relation to this, because so many people talk very highly of P. Diddy. Well, other people definitely got beef. We know Fiddy got beef, right? We know there's a lot of, if you watch, you know, Charlemagne or if you watch any of these podcasts or these radio shows, you know there's tons and years long beef. I mean, even Wendy Williams was talking about P. Diddy and homosexuality and consent and violations years ago. Now, we don't need to be conspiracy theorists. And this is my biggest pet peeve is everyone becomes like a conspiracy theorist. It's not a conspiracy that people who want power are often very corrupt. It's not a conspiracy theory that people with money and status often like rape their way to the top. History is happening now as it was happening then. So if you look back then and you're like, oh, these people are crazy. They're doing crazy things. Thank goodness we don't do that now. Oh, we do it now. We just hide it better. And so remember, the question is like, why are people hiding it better? Well, because they play a game and they convince the audience like, you guys get me. You know what's up. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> Ari says, I feel like it's been well known for many years that Diddy was sus. Bro, it has been well known. So why hasn't anything happened? Well, what's the difference from the women that chose to do nude roles and they were willing to do it for money and clout and the women that genuinely didn't realize what was happening and they were held down and raped? What's the difference from the people who work with P. Diddy or sell their kids to him or sign over their kids to him 
people who think, oh, he's finally going to help my kids. He's going to like really get us like somewhere new. He's going to really make our, li our lives better. And the people that are like selling their kids to R. Kelly. What's the difference from parents who know better and parents who don't if the outcome is your kid getting raped? In December of 2023, Jane Doe says she was gang raped at 17. Fuck censorship. Sorry. You're going to have to like the stream, guys, because I just can't keep up with these like censoring words thing. Then in December, a Jane Doe filed a lawsuit alleging that she was gang raped and sex trafficked by Combs and Harvey Pierre, a former long term, long time president of Combs record label. The unidentified woman said the assault happened in 2003 when she was 17 and Combs was 34. According to the suit, she met Combs and Pierre at a lounge in Detroit and Combs convinced her to travel with them on a private jet to New York City. Before they left the lounge, the suit said Pierre smoked crack cocaine and forced Doe to perform oral sex on him. Doe was taken to the studio in New York City where Combs, Pierre, and a third defendant piled her with copious amounts of drugs and alcohol, the suit said. The three men took turns raping her in the bathroom at the studio after she was too inebriated to consent, according to the suit. The men allegedly left her on the bathroom floor once they were done, and she was flown back to Michigan, the suit said. Combs denied the assault allegations, and Pierre called the suit a tale of fiction. I think what's really important, and probably why I'm incredibly lenient on young people as they make mistakes, is because older people are taking advantage of them. And it's clear time and time again that whether you're good intentioned or bad intentioned, older people have a tendency to think they know better for younger people to such a degree that they will use and abuse them and disguise it as helping out their career, disguise it as getting them out of a bad spot, disguise it as so many things. When Justin Bieber was acting out years and years ago, and even recently, I remember saying to my sister, something fucking happened to that boy, and I'm sick of people ignoring it. Amanda Bynes, even Drake Bell. People don't just fucking have these switches, guys. And if we keep saying, oh, Hollywood really fucks up young people, why are we allowing parents to put their kids in Hollywood without raising an eyebrow? Why are we allowing kids alone with adults? Why are we justifying Drake hanging out with minors? Because it's Drake. Why are we, why are we just, why? Adults and children should not be friends. You guys are not peers, okay? You're not, you're not equals. And I'm talking about minors specifically and adults spending time together. And what's insane is that the parents are part of their kids basically getting sent off to hang out with these adults. So the question is like, what does this have to do with our life? Do you ever look at these people and think, I want to be like them? What are you willing to do to be like them? What are you willing to do? If kids are being sexually abused in foster homes, if we know kids are being sexually abused in churches, if we know kids are being sexually abused at schools, if we know they're being sexually abused in Hollywood, how do we know as parents where, what's safe for our kids? Who's safe for our kids? Orlando Brown is another one. And what did they paint all these kids as? Crazy. But to be fair, they were heavily impacted. And so there's so much that I think people are willing to ignore because it's so much to handle that it's happening. The question is, is it happening everywhere? It's not really happening everywhere. But it's happening in enough places that people need to be more aware that their kids are probably going to be targeted. And worse yet, their kids won't even know they won't even know. They, they'll go into it thinking like, this is just for fun and this is going to be great and I'm going to have my own show without realizing like they're walking into the potentiality of like so much abuse. Okay, let's watch these three videos together because I think it'll be really interesting, right? Stacey says there was an interview where Larry King and Bill Cosby both talked about drugging women to rape uh, them and laugh about it. Oh, I saw it. I saw that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, people tell on themselves. People tell on themselves and we ignore it. That's why I pay attention to like who's willing to do what kind of consent violation while still being nuanced, right? That the regular folks, all of us living our lives, or even them, there's going to be a miscommunication, right? Johnny Depp wasn't an innocent person because he, he was more victimized by Amber Heard, right? Right? He was still a shit person in a lot of ways. Keep in mind, he cheated with Amber Heard, left his partner of like 15 years and his two kids to be with a woman 30 years younger than him. He had anger issues. 
violent like outbursts and was known to abuse drugs. He just happened to be more innocent in the case between him and Amber because Amber lied about things because Amber's crazy. But everyone in Hollywood seems to be crazy, so I'm not that surprised. This is a rundown of the P. Diddy stuff. I just wanted to watch it with you guys first in case anyone's completely out of the bubble. And then we'll hop into two videos, one about Usher and one about Justin Bieber. And I think it will bring a little, we'll just have, a, we'll have a really good conversation around it. But also, can I say that this is a part slightly of why I think most people aren't qualified to be parents. Because I think too many people are willingly ignorant to how many people are targeting their children. Or how many people are willing to put their children in compromising situations to make a living off them, like Britney Spears' parents did. Hip hop legend and media mogul Sean Diddy Combs has seemingly remained untouchable for years. And now the potential downfall of his empire and legacy has taken the hip hop community by storm. But was the writing always on the wall for Diddy's alleged behavior? Several celebrities have casually spoken out about his so-called parties, which lawsuits have alleged to be breeding grounds for sex assault and trafficking. Mm -hmm. Clues of what was allegedly behind the curtain began to emerge in November, when Diddy's former girlfriend, Cassie Ventura, sued the mogul in federal court on allegations of rape and a decade-long pattern of physical and sexual abuse. The singer, who was previously signed to Diddy's Bad Boy Records, claimed the rapper was controlling of every aspect of her life, including where she lived, what she wore, and even her medical records. The suit alleged several instances of abuse committed by Diddy, including battery, rape, and forcing her to have sex with male sex workers. The suit also claims Diddy used intimidation to control the R&B singer, including allegedly having someone blow up another rapper's car after Diddy learned he was interested in romantically pursuing Cassie when they were on a break period from their relationship. This Just a reminder that rumor has it, completely alleged, that Diddy is also responsible for the death of pretty famous people, including Tupac. So it's not that Diddy didn't have rumors about him for all these years and people have told stories. I mean, people who claim they were hired by Diddy have told stories. And so there's a question of like, when are we going to believe people when they tell us who they are? And that's the question is like, are we ready to believe it? But to be honest with you, like who's who's even a good man at this point? Not literally. I mean, even Martin Luther King Jr. cheated on his wife. People be out here cheating, lying, conniving. And the question is, how do you go from cheating on your wife to sex trafficking people? You start by deteriorating any sense of, of goodness, of joy. You start to think you're entitled to people's bodies and time. You start to think, well, I'm not that bad. At least I'm just cheating. Okay. Well, hey, you know, she drank the alcohol. So, well, I mean, we're both, you know, we're both high on meth. <laughs> Okay, sometimes, yes, sometimes y'all are just a bunch of high bitches getting high and having sex. And sometimes y'all are justifying bad behavior because uh, it's not that bad. And the question is, do you know which category it is? So obviously we want to bring in the nuance of the categories, right? So which category are we talking about it? Are you guys just like having fun sex? Or are you guys targeting people, getting them drunk on purpose to take advantage of people because they wouldn't have sex with you sober? Are you having an immoral, unethical, and dangerous relationship with yourself enough to endanger other people. So it's all a spectrum and it starts from somewhere. If you have no values, why not be P. Diddy? If you have values, you have to say no to temptation when temptation comes knocking. Kay says no personal values to keep you within a certain standard of behavior. And that standard of behavior, this is the irony. Diddy, Tate, all these people want the respectability of what a good man is. They want to be considered a hero. They want women to fuck them and men to worship them. They want the money that comes with that alleged respect. They want to be respected. But the disrespect, the ugliness and about their, like their true character is so ugly. But yet they want the reward of having good character. And the question is, what does a good man's life look like? Because it doesn't look like P. Diddy's and it doesn't look like Andrew Tate's. The suit also alleges Diddy became violent, beating Cassie multiple times each year. In one instance, Diddy allegedly pushed her into a car, 
then proceeded to kick her in the face repeatedly. And another claim an intoxicated Diddy allegedly gave Cassie a black eye after she tried to leave a hotel room. The ho now, <clears throat> now, a person in Cassie's situation or in this particular situation in a male-dominated bubble is very different than somebody who's in a very different kind of, quote, male-dominated bubble, right? Like I always said, I would never want to be in the room with like Andrew Tate and those people because they're they're definitely willing to do things that like regular dudes in a room aren't willing to do with women. There's a type of man, a type of male that is going to throw a punch at a woman and the type of men that won't. Now, there is some toxicity to this, like women who are willing to be violent with men knowing they won't throw a punch. And I think that there's something to that that's very toxic. But generally speaking, you're not supposed to punch the person that's definitely weaker than you. You're supposed to hopefully choose the path of less violence. But these men aren't defending themselves. They're targeting weaker people, beating on them to feel powerful, which is different than a man who finds himself in a position where he's being attacked by a woman and has to punch her. Or even a man that chooses never to punch a woman because he's a gentleman like Sanji, right? But also, you know, it's kind of like, why would I do that when I don't have to? So again, there's a difference between a parent who spanks a child because they think they're reinforcing good values and a parent that beats a child because they want to feel strong. The actions might feel the same, but the context makes it totally different. P. Diddy and all of these men aren't hitting women because women are attacking them. They're not hitting women for any other reason than to feel powerful. And can you explain to me where in the description of a good man it involves hitting people that are weaker than you just to like reaffirm in them that you're stronger than them, whether it's a child, an animal, or a woman, or even another man? Hotel security camera footage captured the incident, but Diddy allegedly bought it off for $50,000. Those weren't the only instances of alleged intimidation. The suit claims Diddy dangled Cassie's friend over a 17-story balcony mm -hmm. and asked her to carry a gun in her purse. According to the suit, Cassie never went to the police and tried to leave their relationship multiple times. Again, going to the police and leaving a criminal organization is different than a girl leaving a boyfriend who's toxic, even though that's just as dangerous sometimes. It's not really as dangerous. So as a girl who's dating a toxic boyfriend, oh my God, we just watched a Ray William Johnson story that was insane. This ex-husband just did everything possible to ruin his ex-wife's life, trying to win her back, including kidnapping her, or I'm sorry, hiring people to kidnap her. It was a mess. And that's just a one man destroying one woman's life. Diddy had an empire. Tate has an empire. These people have multiple, multiple, multiple victims and people involved and other people they're convincing to jump on with them. Totally different. It is different when you have one man who's cheating on one woman and it's like a story or one woman who's cheating on one man. That's like a personal battle. Then there's the man who's conniving, manipulating, playing 4D chess, like purposely targeting multiple women to run this whole fantasy story around cheating with multiple people, right? Okay, so there's that, right? And then there's like the difference between um, sort of a bunch of men who get together and find ways to sort of like manipulate women, but they're like fuck boys. They're not like rapists. They're just kind of like fuck boys. Though, let's be honest, there's some line between fuck boy and rapist that's very thin and it's very apparent, right? Because of the amount of lying and coercion and kind of like fake, like the fuckery that they have to do to even convince the women to sleep with them, right? Rashad said Diddy's allegedly had a hard time not putting his hands on everyone. <laughs> you know, the thing about Diddy that is quite woke is that he doesn't discriminate between gender or age. So good for him, I guess, you know. But was too afraid. The suit stated several bad boy records employees turned a blind eye to the physical abuse and beatings Cassie allegedly endured but no one spoke out in fear of their boss. According to the suit, Diddy supplied Cassie with different drugs, including ecstasy and ketamine. The suit claimed Cassie suffered from memory loss from the constant substance abuse during her- You know what sucks too, when there's narcotics involved, drugs of any kind, there's the bubble in which you're taking drugs and it's consensual and beautiful and it's like a great lived experience. You pop a bubble, you meditate, you're like, oh my God. 
And then there's the bubble that takes this beautiful thing and uses it for disgusting reasons to to obviously rape and do horrible things for anyone, right? Or to anyone, sorry. And so it's just sort of one of those things too when we're talking about categories. Are you the drug bubble that uses it to abuse people? Are you the drug bubble that like uses it to have like a great fucking Saturday night, bro? Are you the drinking bubble that uses it to, you know, convince women or men to sleep with you or maybe take advantage of people? Are you the drinking bubble where your buddies and you reminisce about memories for the next 30 years because it was so fun? It's not the drugs. It's not the alcohol. It's not the sex. It's not the orgies. It's the context in which those things are happening that either makes it the coolest night ever or somebody's nightmare. Her relationship with Diddy. The documents also say her MRI results were sent directly to Diddy. The suit was ultimately settled a day after it was filed for an undisclosed amount. Mm. When Diddy's Los Angeles and Miami homes were raided by Homeland Security this week, the singer's attorney released a statement saying, quote, we will always support law enforcement when it seeks to prosecute those that have violated the law. Hopefully this is the beginning of a process that will hold Mr. Combs responsible for his depraved conduct. It wasn't the only instance a former girlfriend of Diddy's came forward alleging instances of abuse. Diddy's ex-girlfriend, Gina Hunt. You know what's interesting too is where the temptation comes in and it comes in from the idea of being picked. I think that's a really big part of this story that people don't, take into consideration because it sounds crazy to say no to a celebrity. You know, sometimes I was just telling my partner, I was like, bro, look at all these DMs I have. And I was like looking at them and I was like, I don't even know who these people are, but they have like lots of followers and like check marks and I don't even know who they are enough, but they'll slide in and they'll say like, oh, hey, Brittany, what's up? And I just ignore all of you because no offense. One, I don't know who you are. And two, I don't need to know who you are. And three, sounds sussy. I just think the more follow followers you have, the more suspicious you are. <laughs> I have a cynicism about famous people because I've met enough people on the road to fame or famous people to know they did not get there with a clean bill of health. So that's why those women that are like Drake slid into my DMs, block him, block him. Why is this a good thing that Drake is sliding into your DMs? This is literally the opposite of good. This is like a nightmare beginning to happen. This is literally, what are you doing? Block? You know what I mean? C CNT says, partner, do you own a business? Well, first of all, obviously, <laughs> I work for myself. But um, my partner, meaning my husband, my, my wonderful, um, I'm trying to come up with a name here. Mm, I got nothing. My partner, my romantic partner. Rashad says the amount of alleged fist fights and assaults that almost everyone in the rap has corroborated concerning Diddy is heavy, bruh. Mm -hmm. Said in a 2019 interview with controversial blogger Tasha Kay that Diddy allegedly stomped on her stomach and punched her in the head during one incident. Hun reportedly. Ooh, girl. Kinder says, Brittany, when her own follower count goes up, why are you so sussy? Br I'm going to question me. I'm going to be the first person to question me. What do you do to get all those followers? Who who are you? What are you doing? You know what I'm saying? Stacey says Drake seems like a low-key predator. Also, hanging out with teenagers, calling them friends. Mm-hmm. He dated Diddy when he and Cassie were on and off. In the interview, she said she pleaded with Diddy to stop hitting her and said she couldn't breathe after he stomped on her stomach. Oof. Just like Cassie, she alleges Diddy was mentally, emotionally, and physically abusive during their time together and claimed Diddy would compare she and Cassie, saying Hun is the bad one and Cassie is the good one. Hun did not take legal action against Diddy. However, her interview resurfaced around the web when Cassie filed her lawsuit against Diddy. And after this week's raid, previous celebrity mm. interviews are also resurfacing and revealing more about Diddy's alleged conduct. In 2016, singer Usher, who had previously lived with Diddy when he was a teenager, told radio personality Howard Stern very curious things. To I know this is going to sound weird, but one of my brothers looks very similar to Usher. <laughs> and every time I see Usher, I think of my brother, which is not surprising because he also looks like Keen Peel. Which one's the tall, skinny one? I always forget the difference between the two. Peel? He looks like him, too, which looks like Usher, which looks like my brother, which is interesting. They have the same face structure they have similar smiles too which is kind of funny but ooh, well, we're gonna watch a video on usher but his parents literally let him live a year with diddy signed over custody to be with a grown man it really be your parents it really be your parents
took place at Diddy's so-called Puffy Flavor Camp. Usher, who was around 13 at the time, had moved to New York City and lived with Diddy, who was going by Puff Daddy, for a year. The idea to live with Diddy came from L.A. Reid, who was Usher's manager. Usher said he went to live with Diddy for a chance to see the lifestyle and referred to the time period as a wild and crazy time in the 90s. And in a 2004 interview with Rolling Stone, Usher was quoted as saying, Puff introduced me to a totally different set of stuff. Sex specifically. Sex is so hot in the industry. There was always girls around. You'd open a door and see somebody doing it or several people in a room having an orgy. You never know what's going to happen. But in Okay, when I talk about orgies and the sex parties I've gone to, I need you to know it's a bunch of nerds who play D&D &D and LARP and like cosplay and anime and they're basically all autistic and we all get together to do those things. Well, I used to in my 20s. In, as a fun, creative way. And um, they all have weird hobbies, like putting glitter all over their, like, you know, corsets or making corsets out of chain link or mail, chain mail, what is it called? Like, I'm hanging out with, like, the nerdiest people. And yes, are there predators in every community? Absolutely. But what I'm saying, there's sex parties. It's done sober or negotiated sober. Drugs are almost never at these parties because they don't want anyone accidentally getting hurt. These are communities that work together to like volunteer their time and like help people be better people. They do sex education classes during the day and parties at night. Like it's such a different bubble than the bubble in which a child is at a sex party. All my parties were legally 18 plus and you had to sign a contract because it was a it was a sex education center. So remember like when people are like, oh, they're having sex orgies and they're degenerates. Yeah, there's a degenerate bubble having orgies. And then there's the nice kind of degenerates that are just having fun and rebelling against their religious upbringing. And the differences between these two worlds is safety and consent. Why would a 14-year-old be witnessing an adult orgy unless those adults are targeting those 14-year-olds? Why are there children at these parties? Because the party is about those children. 2016, when Stern asked whether Puffy's place was filled with chicks and oraging nonstop, Usher responded, not really. It was curious and he got a chance to see things, but didn't know if he could indulge and understand what he was mm -hmm. even looking at. Usher said very curious things took place there that he didn't necessarily understand. As for if it would be a place Usher would consider sending his children to, this is what he had to say. 14 years old. You're a dad now. Would you ever send your kid to puffy camp? <laughs> Hell no. <laughs> Meanwhile, a member of a girl group previously founded and managed by Diddy also spoke out after Diddy's homes were raided by federal agents. On Monday, Aubrey O'Day, who was a part of the group Danity Kane, shared a statement about Combs after the raid saying, quote, what you sow, you shall reap. In December 2022, O'Day said she was fired Damn. from Danity Kane in 2008 because she wasn't willing to do what was expected of her, not talent-wise, but in other areas. She Interesting. See how you know stuff, but you can't say stuff? Because you are terrified for your life. Do you know what gave me this anxiety over celebrities was actually my parents. Because my parents kind of knew some people back in the day for some reason. And they knew people who were connected to like Hollywood and stuff. Um, for no other reason than like weird luck in the same way that I am. I, there's no reason for me to know anybody. I just, for some reason, I end up knowing people. I don't know why it is. I don't know my parents, people. I just don't know what it is. I don't know what the universe is trying to tell me about my life. But then you find out what they want you to do to stay in the loop. What they want you to do to stay in their good graces. What you have to do to keep getting inviting, like to keep getting invited. And it's keep your mouth shut. And open your mouth at the same time or keep your mouth shut and drive us somewhere or keep your mouth shut and uh, make sure no one's taking photos or take – and I'm like, mm, no, nah, I'm out. But you can't even say anything about it because, one, nobody cares and no one believes you. I That's what I'm saying. Nobody's going to care about this who doesn't care about it. There are going to be plenty of people that look at Diddy's life and think, I wish that was my life. And that is humans being humans. It's not to tolerate the behavior, it's to say out loud, like, yep, we have to radically accept there are human beings who want to be this way. And then the question is, what do we do about that? There are human beings that will do anything they can to stay in power and abuse that power and force people to do what they want to maintain that power. And how do you know the difference between someone with a big fo following 
who's using their power for evil and someone with a big following who's using their power for good? How do you actually know the difference? I think it starts with what you consider moral and valuable and then how you think that impacts the greater society. I don't think any of us are not aware that our politicians aren't perfect, that our priests aren't perfect, that our teachers aren't perfect, that our parents aren't perfect, that our friends aren't perfect, that everybody in our life isn't perfect, that we are not perfect. But I do think we fit into different categories. There are just some people who have such a moral compass that I know I can trust them with my kids. And there are other people who have a questionable moral compass that I'm not going to put it past them to risk the safety of my kids for something that might be tempting to them. Maybe money, maybe they're bored, maybe they, you know, I meet people all the time that are willing to risk the, the safety of children for some sort of high that they're, that they're reaching for. And that's what temptation is. Temptation is the thing that brings you furthest from joy. Which is why, you know, we formed as a species these great religions and these great like moral, you know, codes and sort of like this idea of like, this is my honorable, this is what an honorable man does. This is what a good woman does. This is what a good person is. But I think in order to be that person, you have to be it in public and behind closed doors. That's why I want people who walk the walk. Because what good is it that you preach no harming children if you're fucking kids behind closed doors, my bros? What good is it if you preach be good to the women in your life if you are being bad to the women in your life? What good is it to preach that you support men and men's mental health if you're mentally abusing men behind closed doors? I want you to walk the walk. Because talking the talk is why we have P. Diddy. Because he talked the talk and people thought good enough. He had the money so people thought good enough. It's not going to stop with Diddy. And I'm so excited because Cat Williams said it. 2024 is it, baby. And I'm here for it. But it doesn't stop with them. It's going to continue with new people. Every person right now that we feel like, oh, they're finally getting exposed, are going to be replaced with the next person. And that's just life. So how does this relate to us, our normie people, and our nine to fives? Count your blessings that all you have to do is go to work and pay your bills. And that your boss isn't gang raping you. Or that you're not part of a bubble that normalizes assaulting children. Now, of course, that doesn't mean there aren't issues. That doesn't mean people of nine to fives don't have those things happening. It's just not the same bubble, right? So count your blessings. All I got to do is pay my bills and watch Netflix and continue my anime. Okay? Ari says, how the fuck did Cat Williams know? Because we all know. We all know, but we don't know what it means to know something. Do you know what I mean? We all know, but we don't know what to do with that information. How do you say, like, we all know, but it's not enough. Why do you think that we know and there's nothing to do about it? Why do you think knowing something makes it so much harder to even do anything about it? Everybody knows. Everyone in Nickelodeon knew. All those kids knew. All the adults knew. Why was it hard for even one person to come out and say something? Why is it hard now when we call out Andrew Huberman for serial targeting women and mentally abusing them and cheating on them and breaking their consent? Why is it so hard for people to say, yeah, that's really bad. You shouldn't do that. Not only should you not do that, but I don't want to work with somebody that's willing to do this to people. Why is it so hard for Lex Friedman to say, hey, you shouldn't treat people like that? Because I think deep down, they're not so sure it's that, bad, that big of a deal. I'm not sure that people deep down think it's that big of a deal to abuse people. I mean, hell, the whole world was built off abuse. I think we all have abuse stories from our parents in some capacities or some, some line of dysfunction. Hell, I just watched Love is Blind and I watched how obviously abusive Clay's father was to him growing up and how that impacted him. We don't even know how to tackle abuse because it is a spectrum. It's a spectrum of abandoning your children all the way to raping them. And each spectrum, each category deserves its own repercussion. 
She said she wasn't the only girl that was in those types of positions. This past September, Diddy announced his plans to reassign publishing rights to select Bad Boy Records artists, hmm. including O'Day's group, Danity Kane. But O'Day claimed Diddy's deal came with strings attached, those strings being non-disclosure agreements, also known as NDAs, that the artist had to sign. O'Day said the- Oh, you know who else loves NDAs? Steven Crowder. You know who else has been, there's been rumors about him for years? You know who else? Was caught on tape verbally abusing his wife. Even when it's caught on tape, it's not enough. The NDA agreement included the artist would not disparage Puff, Bad Boy, Janice Combs, Diddy's mother, Justin Combs Music, EMI Publishing, or Sony ever in public. And despite Diddy presenting the music... And this is why I'm values over loyalty. Because if Diddy was my sibling, oh, I'd find a way to bust that bitch. I'd find a way. But a lot of people wouldn't. Lots of family members are willing to... Remember that the mafia, right? If you think about the old, like, Catholic mafia, Mario Puzo kind of mafia, there's a real family uh, values thing to it, you know? They're, they believe in family values. But they're also gunning people down. You know, they go to church. They're also raping their wives. They go to church. They're also paying off the cops. You know what I'm saying? Music group Danity Kane with their publishing rights. O'Day said... Now, hold on. In a philosophy sense, reaching out of the bubble and observing humans, they're just doing very human things. Organizing groups, forming tribes, having shared language, creating little structure systems having children, procreating, spreading their message. And that is what humans will do. That is what they're doing. Now, the question is, what kind of a community do you want to belong to? And if there's no community that fits you, how do you as an individual learn to live within a community that most, mostly allows you to live the life you want without needing to get involved in the messiness? How do you do that? That's the question you have to ask yourself. Now, I think I found it. Obviously, for myself, I created like this little bubble within an awareness that I share bubbles with other people because I live in a society. But I don't have to do any of this. I get to come home every day. This is my job. So you guys get to witness me at work. I am witnessed. My work is witnessed, right? And then after I get off work, I'm basically watching anime, making love to my husband, and hanging out with my cat, going on walks enjoying my life. That is my life. And that is the life I've always wanted. And that is the life I get. I get to just go to work, pay my bills, spend time with my family, go to work, pay my bills, spend time with my family. And I am so lucky that that is my life. Because this dream that I used to have being famous, hanging out with famous people, doing famous things, having shit tons of money, all of that came with a price I've never been willing to pay. And I will not do it. No amount of money will let me sleep at night knowing that I've had to shake hands or associate with people that do things that make me want to just vomit. What is my cat's name? Her name is Indiana Jones and she's wonderful. Here's her emoji. Members get a Indiana Jones emoji in the chat. That doesn't equal more money for the group, saying the deal would only bring her less than $1,000 in royalties. Another former artist of Diddy also reacted to this week's raid of Diddy's homes. Rapper Mace called the raid big payback and said it was amazing it happened on the anniversary of Life After Death, which was the last album posthumously released by Diddy's best friend, Notorious B.I.G. Mace and Diddy have a long and embattled history. Mace was previously signed to Bad Boy Records in the 90s and the early 2000s. He gave his publishing rights to Diddy for $20,000. Also alleged rumors about... Mm -hmm. He attempted to get his catalog back years later. He publicly slammed Diddy when the mogul turned down Mace's offer to buy back his publishing for $2 million. Diddy ultimately gave the publishing rights back to Mace. Mace, who had previously worked with Diddy on hits such as Can't Nobody Hold Me Down and Mo Money Mo Problems, before going on to have a successful solo career, said he escaped Diddy. During his podcast, which he hosts with fellow rapper Cameron, he seemingly referred to the serious allegations against Diddy, saying, everything now that we see playing out was all the things I escaped. <sighs> Meanwhile, rapper 50 Cent taunted Diddy on Instagram after the feds raided his homes. The two have been feuding 
including since the early 2000s. 50 Cent, whose real name is Curtis Jackson, wrote, quote, Now it's not did he do it, it's did he done. They don't come like that unless they got a case. The beef between the two seemingly dates back to 2006 when 50 released a diss track called The Bomb, where he claimed Diddy knew who shot and killed Biggie in 97. Mm -hmm. Since then, the two have made... That's the alleged I was going to mention. Allegedly, Diddy might know. Sage says, what if a person is um, in too deep thing? Or what if what if it's an in too deep thing for people? Um, I think that tends to be the case for these people. So yeah, I do think some of these people are in too deep. But I also don't believe in that idea. Um, I think it's an idea we convince ourselves of because the bubble is so suffocating. So there is just like a reality of in too deep. And I'm in too deep and I'm trying to... Anyways, there is that reality, right? So the question is, what happens if you're in too deep? Well, you die or keep going or you get out. You have three options. Keep going, sink deeper, kill yourself, which I don't recommend, or find a way out. Finding a way out is and will be the most exhausting thing you will ever do. But I really think this is your only life. And so when the time comes, it feels wrong not, not to try to live that life to the best of your ability. And at the same time, I understand how difficult that sounds when you're in too deep. But it's also kind of crazy if you look at human history, what humans have been able to overcome. They really have, you know, so my heart goes out to people who are in too deep because it's got to be so real. And then at the same time, I know that there's a way out. The question is, will they have the tools to do it? Having the tools to do it is kind of key. I think Cassie eventually got those tools, which is why she got out. And then the question is, like the Andrew Tate girls that want to stay with him, they might be in too deep or they might just be like him. So first we have to acknowledge that some people are just like that. Some people are just as fucked up. How do you tell the difference from the fucked up person that wants to be there and the person that really wants out and they don't know how to get out? That is really difficult to know. That's why I think it's so easy to go after people on the internet and say like they're lying, they're scheming, they, there's no way they believe this. Maybe. Or maybe they're in too deep. And when you're in too deep, you see no other options. Which is why I like categorization because I want to give people their proper categorization so we can give them their proper way out. Real victims do exist. And then there are people who are just as shitty as the predators that they're victims of. Because you can be a victim and a predator. You can. Marina Joy says, hey, Brittany, is this stream going to be uploaded later? I don't think I'll be able to stay for the whole stream, but I'd love to watch later. So my streams get members only after I'm done, but I will upload this as a clip in the next like day or so. So yes, this section will be uploaded as a clip. But if you want to watch it unedited without any like, you know, whatever, I keep it, I keep it available for members. So Day says, I think people convince themselves of this in too deep idea like they like they think they had no choice but to go along with the messed up situation. I mean, I think some people do have no choice. Um, and I think some people have more choices. So I think for a lot of people, they don't. I was watching um, Fat Joe. Fat Joe was asked in an interview, what do you think of the P. Diddy stuff? He's like, man, I got nothing to say about P. Diddy. You know, I've known him three years, 30 years. No comment, no comment. Fat Joe knows. There ain't no fucking way he don't know. There ain't no way. And then the question is, when do you spill someone's story? When do you say something? You know those conservatives that are always coming up with conspiracy theories to take down the child predators, but they won't take down the child predators in their own homes? I think they're just as bad as the child predators of the people they're allegedly trying to take down. Because I know for a fact they're hiding child predators. And that's the problem. When do we out people? Some people said Andrew Huberman's story should never have been made public. All he did was cheat with six different women and convince them all he was with them and monogamous. And mon But at what point do you speak up? And then at what point when he does something worse, are you responsible for not speaking up? And that's the conundrum. At what point are we responsible for speaking up? And at what point are people just making really sloppy decisions that are nobody's business? Because some people make really stupid decisions that really aren't a sign of predatory behavior. They're just really sloppy and messy. And then some people are making decisions that are methodical, pathological. They've got major patterns. And they're probably going to do it again. And they're probably going to do it worse the next time. 
How do you know the difference between somebody that's going to fuck lots of people up because they're targeting them and somebody who fucks people up because they're fucked up and they don't really intend to fuck people up, but at the same time. Mm hmm numerous comments on each other. When Cassie sued Diddy in November, 50 Cent said his production company was working on a documentary about the sexual assault allegations against Combs. Even posting a clip to social media featuring bad boy rapper Mark Curry alleging Diddy spiked women's drinks at parties. The Diddy allegations also- Look, if college boys are spiking women's drinks, men in positions of power that are obsessed with dominance who have a 30-year record of taking um, advantage of people and breaking consent, they're definitely spiking people's drinks ventured into the comedy world, where comedian Cat Williams also previously made comments about Diddy's alleged wild- Stacey says Diddy made sure everyone he was around got so dirty they could not report him. I believe that. That's good. See? That's evil good business right there, baby. Yep. Guys, if our police forces are corrupt, you think our music industries are in? Our churches are literally harboring child predators. Our churches. Why are we acting shocked? when we see it in the military, when we see it in any kind of group of people, why are we like, oh, not the music industry? Why not? It's happening in the house of God. You think it's not happening in your music industries? Balto says, yep, those are the same people that protect predators because woke feminism also. If it's a church, they cover up abuse reports to protect their ch church's image. I'm just like when SBC got exposed. Who's SBC? Which was SBC? I don't know that. SBC. SBC. Who's SBC? You know. Parties. In January, Williams spoke out about Diddy during Shannon Sharp's Club Shay Shay podcast. Williams said, I got to protect my integrity because if P. Diddy be wanting to party and you got to tell him no. And just weeks mm -hmm. prior to the raid, music producer Rodney Jones Jr., also known as Lil Rod, filed a $30 million lawsuit against Diddy, alleging sexual harassment and threatening him for more than a year. According to the suit, Jones claims he was subjected to possible drugging and rape, ritual humiliation, and being cheated out of more than $50,000 for work on Diddy's album. The suit also names actor Cuba Gooding Jr. Jones believes Diddy was grooming him in an attempt to pass him off to Gooding, leaving the two alone in a studio on Diddy's yacht. I did not know this. I did not know this, Sam I am. What? Where Gooding is alleged to have groped and fondled Jones when the two were left alone. Diddy has denied Jones's allegations against him. Diddy's lawyer released a statement calling the allegations outlandish and accused Jones of lying. The statement reads, quote, Lil Rod is nothing more than a liar who filed a $30 million lawsuit shamelessly looking for an undeserved payday. His reckless name dropping about events that are pure fiction and simply did not. <gasps> pure fiction is Diddy and his friends favorite thing to say about accusers. Fiction, complete fiction, absolute fiction, total fiction. They love to, I've noticed this in everything that I've seen or read, everyone on his team keeps saying fiction, complete fiction. Happen is nothing more than a transparent attempt to garner headlines. Lil Rod's attorney told Rolling Stone when Diddy's homes were raided, it's about damn time. Sometimes justice delayed is not justice denied so long as justice ultimately arrives. After Monday's raid, Diddy's lawyer- I mean, did you guys hear about the alleged connection? that P. Diddy and Jay-Z have in relation to Becky with the good hair or possibly one of the women that Jay-Z was having an affair with and got pregnant? How she was unalived? Nobody, nobody becomes a billionaire ethically. And Beyonce and Jay-Z and P. Diddy be billionaires, right? I think Jay-Z is technically a billionaire. But women married to these men they know i always wondered why beyonce didn't leave jay-z after he cheated lawyer issued a statement saying in part quote it was a gross overuse of military level force there is no excuse for the excessive show of force and hostility exhibited by authorities or the way his children and employees were treated mr combs was never detained by but spoke to and cooperated with authorities there's no finding of criminal or civil liability with any of the allegations Mr. Combs is innocent and will continue to fight every single day to clear his name. According to lawyers. Okay. <clears throat> now, so that was the first video. I'll link it for you guys so you guys can go ahead and check that out. And then, okay, so now that was the overall up to date. That's basically what we're dealing with. Now, there's this video I want to watch with you. And this is about, and I want to explain to you how there's like a spectrum and how cycles continue. So obviously, once again, everything is a spectrum. If you hear me talk and think, oh my God, Brittany's saying men who cheat on their wives or cheat on their partners or cheat in general is the same as raping little babies. Like you guys are fucking unhinged. That's not what I'm saying. 
And the fact that you keep saying that tells me you're brain dead and need to exit my channel. Thank you. I'm saying on a spectrum, pain and hurt escalates over time and corruption follows. So you might start off just cheating and thinking like, who fucking cares? But what is the premise of cheating? It's a consent violation. It's a lie. It's you giving into temptation. It's you being, your word being useless, right? You cheating is the beginning steps of you picking yourself and your ego over any possible harm done to other people, right? Think about the people that are cheating uh, and in order to cheat have to maybe put people's lives in danger. Like um, maybe like, uh, oh, what about the mom that left her little girl at home to go get drugs? But instead it was like an affair, let's say. or the dad who's supposed to have his kids that weekend, but instead leaves the kids, you know, at home alone to go get sex. Or think about again, like what you're willing to do to put other in, in order, like what you're willing to do at the consequence of putting other people at harm in harm's way. All those things are different than all the way to P. Diddy sex trafficking. But there's a line that connects. And the question is, when are you going to stop? When is your story going to be? Yeah, I was a cheater but I was never a sex trafficker. Yeah, I was a cheater, but I never did this because I knew I was never going to be that kind of person. And the question is, once you're that kind of person, can you come back from it? And that's a whole other question and conversation. The idea is that it's a spectrum. So you might think to yourself, like, who cares if I lie or if I do this? Well, maybe nobody. But don't you think it's interesting that even you don't care? Or what about a person that says, you know, look, I'm in my 60s, but this like 17 year old, they're just so mature for their age and I feel so connected to them. And I just feel like I wanna give them the world. Do you wanna give them the world in a way that actually helps them or in a way that is centered around your ego and how they make you feel about yourself? Is this truly really about helping that 17 year old or is it about the relationship you're having with yourself? Maybe on this planet of 8 billion people, there's a genuine connection happening out there in the universe or maybe, more likely, more probable. You've got two really fucked up people and one person who's older and having an experience of connecting with somebody that is so beyond young in comparison to them that at that moment, if they really cared or thought about that other person past their own ego, they probably would choose to disengage. But they don't because it becomes about the illusion and the fictional tale they tell themselves in relation to this. Now, of course, there are bad people and even maybe even false accusers. Maybe Diddy has some people that are falsely accusing him of something he didn't do. But maybe that doesn't take away from the people that were genuinely harmed all the same, right? So this story is called Usher opens up about Diddy sacrificing his childhood fame or his childhood for fame. So remember the fame bubble, that's a decision you can make. Lots of parents mostly make it for their kids. And it's usually at the sacrifice of their childhood and innocence. So every time you see a child star, if you're like me, you'll raise an eyebrow and wonder, were they a victim and who victimized them? First and foremost, their parents, right? First and foremost, parents, right? Okay, let's watch this together just to get another idea of what it's like when the parents are the ones who, who basically sacrifice their children. Before he met Diddy, Usher was a kid who believed he was destined to be great. I want to have an name for myself. It was his dream. If I don't believe it, nobody else would. When he was only 13, the world started believing in his talent. Hey! Young man is going places. The next Michael Jackson. But to become a star, he had to spend a year with a man he barely knew. You've changed your name to Love. I have become Love. Okay. We're sending you New over York to City. something called Puffy Flavor Camp. Did you so, feel like that took away from your childhood at all? Flavor Camp was Usher's last chance at having a career. Giving up is not an option in life. There's always a way. The allegations are absolutely horrific. Were you the only kid at Puffy Flavor Camp? Where we hanging out and what we doing? Come on. We, we can't really disclose. Music mogul Sean Diddy Combs accused of <laughs> and was sold. But Usher didn't. And by the way, there ends up being an overlap with the bubble of people that blame children for seducing adults in this bubble. I have literally had grown ups to my face say they feel like that child seduced that adult. That child was five years old. 
That child was 16 years old. That child was 17 years old. And these adults were older by 10, 20 years, depending on the situation. Human beings are not perfect. We're like little evolved animals on the planet. The question is, are you different? Or are you ready to change that cycle of abuse? Because that's what it comes down to is you. You can't hold other people accountable. You can only hold yourself accountable through your own values. So when temptation comes knocking on your door, are you going to answer it? It's okay if everyone else does in a sense, as long as you don't. But the question is, what if you do? How do you come back from that? Right? You would say, maybe Cassie said yes to temptation and then wanted to say no to it. And because Cassie came forward with her story, she probably helped propel Diddy into getting in trouble enough to hopefully save people in the future. But remember, even if Diddy goes away, even if 50 people go away this year, that's 50 people on a planet of 8 billion. Didn't just survive Flavor Camp. He thrived from it. You know, I'll never forget the first day I'm getting ready to do a showcase for my- Also keep in mind, we're gonna go over Justin Bieber later. Justin Bieber was allegedly being protected by Ellen. And what do we know about Ellen? A record company, my golden ticket was my voice. And I lost it. This girl is changing my mind, so what? I really don't care. I gotta hit it, you know, for doing all them high notes. Hey man, it's just puberty, you're gonna go through it. But when you raise your voice to sing and you could do it so easily, now it's not there, it's gone. And you don't know if it's gonna come back either. I waited all my life for this opportunity. So I performed before this audience. I think I may have ran about 10 miles. When I got back, my mother, she told me, I know this is hard, but um, we're gonna we're gonna fight for it. We're gonna fight through it. And I'm gonna make sure that they don't drop you. When Usher was just 13 years old, his mother was hell bent on making him a star. I mean, I had a mother. Starts with the parents. That we was strict. <laughs> she's a big influence in your life, oh, right? Definitely. She, you know, she's my manager and I keep her with me everywhere I go. But during their next meeting with the label, Usher would have to make a sacrifice if he was going to keep his dream alive. They didn't want me in. They would actually say, You're too close to the project. Oh, Puffy was there. I didn't know him. And he said, You're going to have to trust me. Puff Daddy becomes the legal guardian of young singer Usher Raymond. He's going to uh, mentor you and show you the life. We're sending you New over York to City. something called Puffy Flavor Camp. I'm gone. I want to entertain. My mother was like, you're not going to be one of those people who's just sitting around and sleeping on my couch. Just don't worry about it. I'll be gone by 14. But although his new mentor was a talented producer, working with him came at a cost. You can believe the hype. We banging, baby. As you see, it's female friendly. We showing the fuck off tonight. You spent a million and a half dollars on the party? I think they never been to a tea party. But Usher was quickly thrown into a world he didn't understand. You know, most kids will be excited about it. I'm around grown women, and I'm seeing them do things, and, and... The rumors keep mounting about rapper Diddy's parties. The allegations are absolutely horrific. The parties had a reputation for being filled with drugs, orgies, and suspicious behavior around children. Breaking news, Diddy adopted a white child. <laughs> you still have beautiful parents, but you're my child also. Now how the f did the Me Too movement miss this? Because the Me Too movement was sort of a child's dream of justice. The Me Too movement was a child's dream of what they thought justice would be because they didn't even know what it was aiming for. I appreciate the effort around the Me Too movement but it was like a child came up with this idea of like, we're going to take down the bad guys and it's going to be so great. But they mixed in stories that didn't match the point, mixed in with stories that did. And the Me Too movement missed so many good, well, good. It missed so many predators because it was like, it was just executed in the most superficial way. And I'm, I can't even be mad about it because like humans are going to human, it's going to make mistakes and everything's going to, but just a reminder that this is not the end of it. We still live on a planet with 8 billion people with all different kinds of beliefs from exact, and it, this is exactly my point about morals. They are your decision to have them. You are the, the arbiter of your own morals. You get to decide what you think is morally correct and then you get to do it, guys. You get to make the decision. So when people make decisions 
it is a reflection of their morals. Now the question is, when is when is this who they'll always be and when is it a possibility for them to change? Always and right now and never. A person is living in a moment of time. That's my belief. And whether or not the moment lasts, a lifetime is up to them. Now what you're making bets on is whether or not they'll stay this person forever. And the hope is that they won't, but the probability is that they will. And then they have to really recognize, oh, they're choosing to stay this person, which is why the cognitive dissonance plays a role and the lying to the self comes in. I'm not a bad person. I'm not in a, you know, I'm not doing this right now. I'm just like reacting to other people. I'm put in this position. I have to be this way. So they don't have to hold themselves accountable. Your morals are about you, not about society. The only person who can hold you accountable to your morals are you. You're the only person who knows what's truly there and what's a performative right? What's, what, what is the thing you say to the public and what is the thing you really do? So you get to make that you are so powerful and so able. And the question is, are you going to be honest with yourself enough to hold yourself accountable? Where are we hanging out and what are we doing? Oh, and by the way, for people like Diddy, these are his morals. He doesn't need to hold himself accountable. He's living the life he's always wanted. And what's the difference, right? Do people serial cheat on their partners because they think it's the greatest thing to do? At some point, no, it's their trauma. And at some point, yeah, they think it's the right thing to do. And again, it's about categorization. Which one are they? Are they the category of person who's reacting out of trauma so they're in too deep? Or is it the person who's like, actually, my morals say that I can do this and I don't think it makes me a bad person because I don't think Diddy thinks he's a bad person. I think he, he thinks he's living a great life like Andrew Tate. Andrew Tate doesn't think he's a bad person. You can't make Andrew Tate feel bad about sex trafficking women. He, he thinks he's a good person. But people, some people, especially people who can't handle criticism in a very particular way, they know they're fucking up and they're not willing to face themselves. And then the question is, are they going to stay in that moment? Are they going to grow out of it? Justin Bieber has been a brat, a tantrum throwing child for years, a destructive little vandal. And everyone said, I wonder what's making him lash out. Could it have been the fact that he spent way too much time with grown adults in very compromising situations that his parents put him in so they could sell out and make him famous? And by the way, Justin Bieber got into Diddy's arms because Usher put him there. And the parents didn't have the wisdom to say, I'm not going to put my kid in this situation because everyone around them was like, how could you say no to Diddy? How could you say no to Usher? This is amazing. What an opportunity. What an opportunity. We, we can't really disclose, but um, it's definitely a 15-year-old's dream. Um, I don't really, I don't have legal guardianship of him. Uh, I, I had legal guardianship of Usher when, when you know, he, he did his first album. I did Usher's first album. When Usher came to live with Diddy, his mom signed over legal guardianship to him. That baby came out of your body, was your responsibility, and you gave it over to a man who put that child in a situation to witness orgies, drug parties, and unconsensual behavior. I wonder if she thinks she's a good mom now. I wonder if Usher's mother to this day thinks that was the best decision I made for my son. But for the next 48 hours, he's with me. So, um, and, and, and we're going to go full, buck full crazy. We're going crazy. Crazy. How did you make sure that people didn't take advantage of him? My mother used to tell me all the time, you need to stop telling people that you're going to be a big artist. I'm like, why? That's what I believe. That's what I think about myself. If I don't believe it, nobody else would. Though Diddy was extremely controversial, he also gave Usher freedom he never had. Greater than just being an artist, that man helped me understand life. He helped me understand what it was to be an artist. He helped me understand what it, be, what it was to be passionate about something. At the root of Usher's passion for music was a kid looking for his father. There's nothing like a father's love. I suffered a long time. Discord says some people just love money more than their kids, sadly. Yeah, some people really love money more than their kids. Pay attention to when they tell you stories. Pay attention to the fact that people will literally pick their jobs over their kids 
pick money over their kids, pick women over their kids. People tell on themselves all the time. What is the difference from a dad or a mom that picks their job over spending time with their kids and a parent that sells their kid to Hollywood for a paycheck? What's the difference, right? It's a spectrum, so there is a difference. But when is the line appropriate? When does the parent become the parent that's willing to sell their kids to R. Kelly? What's better, a parent that walks out to get milk and never comes back or a parent that stays in your life and sells you to R. Kelly? What's better, a parent that's in your life every day but beats you every night because they want to show you discipline in a bad way or a parent that goes out for milk and never comes back? What's better? making moves based off of the fact that I didn't have a dad. And I was the kind of kid that, you know, I always wanted the most attention. So I would go over and beyond to make sure that I got it, whether it was dancing, singing, and that actually just turned into my talent. <laughs> Usher and Diddy started work on the album. And even though Usher's voice had changed, Diddy made Usher feel accepted. You may not be able to rap, you may not be able to sing, but there's something else that you could do. You know, a lot of our young brothers and sisters, there's nobody that's showing them and guiding them through, through the business. And as he broke free from the control of his mother, Usher found a father figure. Puff Daddy. Thank, thank, keep your dream going, baby. As a result of being around that man, I don't sleep to this day. Savage, oh, savage! Oh! I mean, this is a dude who just never slept. You're like assault for like 30 motherfucking days. And that, that commitment, I picked up. And the winner is Usher, Usher. As Usher became one of the most committed artists in the industry, he also became notorious for his sex appeal. I just felt confident enough to tell anybody, this is who I am. Have you or do you make love to your own music? <laughs> Mr. Steal Your Woman is a long way from the church singer he started out as. You wanna make I feel like he has a confession. In this business, you have to be willing to make the sacrifices that come with it. But despite getting everything he'd ever dreamed of, something was still missing. You know, there's accolades. Hey, Mom, I made it. Yeah. Where's Dad? Usher was about to become a father, but he had never gotten to know his own. I began to think about what life would be if I just decided to never know him. Now, this is what's interesting, too, because we're talking about generational curses. We're talking about family trauma. We're talking about generational trauma. We're talking about so many things that play a role in this. And again, in, this is why I, I try to hold you guys <clears throat> to your standard of individual in a philosophy sense, not like some libertarian bullshit political sense. Fuck politics, right? We're talking about the consciousness. You as the individual have to recognize, if you want, that all around you, everyone is living their own like main character life like you are. And everyone is having a different relationship with perception to the same event that you're, you're experiencing. So many people around you will normalize horrible behavior. And then you yourself have to decide, is this what I want to call my normal? When people tell me, because I say, hey, fighting and arguing and cussing at your partner is a red flag, and they go, Brittany, that's normal. You're telling on yourself. You're saying in my bubble, it's common expected behavior that people will verbally abuse their partners. So Brittany, you need to accept that it's normal. Yes, in a philosophy sense, I radically accept that human beings will choose this way of living as their normal. And in an introspective way, I will choose to do something different. Because I, according to my morals, cannot be a person who can proudly say fighting is normal, yelling at my partner is normal, cussing at my partner is nor normal. I used to be a person that would be engaging in behavior like that with my ex-partners. And I'd be like, whoa. And I would stop us in the middle of a fight and be like, hey, why are we fighting? This isn't normal. My partner would say, yes, it is. And I would say, I never saw my parents fighting like this. Why are we doing it? Well, because we were too unhealthy. And so making the decision to be a different person Saying to myself, like, I'm not this person. This isn't who I want to be. This doesn't re represent my values. I had to then ask myself, well, then what are your values? Because you're doing it right now. What good are your values if you're acting like a piece of shit? So then I had to decide, okay, I'm going to live by my values. That was a very difficult decision. It meant cutting a lot of people out of my life. It meant putting down very strong boundaries for myself. Meaning no ultimatums on other people. You do you. But I'm going to remove myself. See, I don't put ultimatums on people. I simply say, you do you, if you keep doing that, which I understand is a part of your story, your perspective, I need to exit the story with peace and love. 
It's amazing what people will do and then try to pretend they're taking some sort of like ethic moral high ground. And and it's up to you to have the boundaries in terms of engagement. So when I look at stories like this and I try to think of his mother and I try to think about now with everything coming out, how much she feel and does she feel like at the end of the day she did what she thought was best, which ironically enough is probably true. I think in a philosophy sense, you have to radically accept that everyone is doing what they think is best, even when they're tricking themselves or lying to themselves. And then the question is, how do you make sure that you are not just doing your best, but you're doing introspective work to do even better than your best next time? Because we're always just doing our best. But some people's best never gets, some people's best never incorporates wisdom. And wisdom is, in my case, I'm not saying I'm a wise person, but hopefully I'll have moments of wisdom. I want to know what Usher's mom is thinking. What is Justin Bieber's mom thinking? What are all these people thinking when they look at their kids and realize I did this to them? Are they ready to take responsibility without blaming anyone and without even their kids blaming them? Are they able to hold themselves accountable to their morals or values? Because again, this isn't about blaming or pointing a finger. This is about saying we live in a world where people don't have the moral compass to hold themselves accountable because they don't actually in this moment of time think they're doing anything wrong. And even if they do think deep down it's wrong, they're not the kind of person who can act in conjunction with that feeling because they're not ready. And I didn't want my life to go that way. So I reached out to him. Even Starvo says not always, sometimes people do things out of spite. Even when you do things out of spite, You think you're doing the thing you should do or the best thing to do in the moment. Even when you're taking revenge, even when you think it's justice, even when you're doing things, you're doing things that you want to do in the moment or you think or feel is right, you end up doing them. Most people who do things out of spite don't then turn around and say, fuck, my bad. Oh, Usher's mom died a while ago. I think I do remember that. Thanks, Cam Cam, for the reminder. I forgot. Okay, so great. Now his mom is dead. It was so hard. It was, it was hard because I I make the decision whether you live or you die. That right there killed me. It's like, I'm not ready for that. He's being held in intensive care at the time. They say he needs his transplant. So imagine if you decide at this moment to just let it go and not try. I put my anger aside and um, I did it. And within the process of undergoing a liver transplant, he slipped into a coma. And uh, he didn't make it back. Mm. I guess the hardest part of this story is the fact that within the process of making the decision of whether my father lives or dies, if they take him off of the, the machine, my son is across town just being born. The whole purpose and reason behind even trying to fix this relationship was to make sure that my son knew where his name came from. But I lost that opportunity. He never got a chance to meet him. I tried my best to right the wrong that was my father. He made a decision not to be in my life. So now I make the decision to be in my children's life. Now, Usher watches closely over his kids like his mother used to do with him. I personally hold you to a higher standard because I know what work it takes to be great. Mm -hmm. Anything that you want to be great at, you have to make it a process. Like it's, it's a part of your every thought. Over time, Usher distanced himself from Diddy, but he gave his kids the freedom to be themselves, like he'd learned from him. To have a dad that you can talk to and be able to be transparent with to help your kids, I think it's important. Usher and Aviv will never know a day where there's a father who wasn't there or who elects not to be there. I'm gonna be there for him. I'm gonna be as helpful as I possibly can and be strong for them and strong with them. When life shows itself to be tumultuous, it's because you're being prepared for something greater. That's what I believe. Okay, so that's about Usher and Diddy, right? And I think that's interesting. I think it says a lot about how people get places, but see how they ended on such a positive note? It wasn't without suffering. 
And the question is, do you know how to suffer wisely? And I think that is what I would love to give everybody is like the tool to learn how to suffer wisely. Because I do think we we suffer without wisdom. Like even if you go back to the controversies we've been covering this week, lots of unnecessary suffering because nobody knows how to suffer wisely. They are still suffering. And I think suffering that doesn't have a wisdom to it is the wrong kind of suffering. It's the one, suffering that leads you closer to your joy is the right kind of suffering and suffering that leads you more towards evil is the wrong kind of suffering. And the question is, is like, which is which? Okay, this one's about Justin Bieber, okay? P. Diddy, a.k.a. Sean Diddy Combs, is on the run after his homes in both Miami and Los Angeles were raided by Homeland Security weeks after he was accused of sex misconduct and alleged... Okay, first of all, um, this is like, there was like footage in his home and there was all of these things coming out. If you guys didn't see any of that footage, it's not really that important. What's mostly important is where the fuck is Diddy? ...by Homeland Security weeks after he was accused of sex misconduct and alleged traffic. An old video of him and a 15-year-old Justin Bieber has emerged amidst the turmoil, which now appears significantly more troubling given the circumstances. This was the video in question, and I want you guys to pay close attention... Uh, no. Uh, says life is not without suffering. It is what you choose to suffer through the what matters or through that matters, like learning a new skill. Y'all, please read The Art of Not Giving a Fuck. It's so introspective. The Art of Not Giving a Fuck, and I'm so sorry to break your heart, is probably one of the least introspective books I've ever read in my life. Now, it did help me when I was in my, like, 20s, and it was an interesting book, but if you read it again in your 40s, or depending on where you are in your introspection journey, it's a completely different book. I reread it again, and I was like, why did I think this book was so helpful? And it was helpful because at the time I didn't know anything. But it's totally a two book. I think it's a pretty shallow book. I think most of the books that sell in the self-help aisle are shallow levels of introspection. I'm going to be really critical of that book because I think a lot of people read it without understanding like, oh, there's so much more. But also, it's only helpful in a particular bubble. I think you should read it so you know what people are talking about. Right? I've read thousands of books. Oh, see? Good point. I'm 19, so it helped. It did help me in my 20s as well. So that's really good. Right? It is a very fascinating book in a bubble. It's called The Art of Not Giving a Fuck. It's on Spotify audiobooks, I think. And it's interesting. And it was helpful to me in my 20s. But I cannot wait for you to keep reading because there's so much more. The reason I think it did so well as a New York Times bestseller is because it was really, really digestible. And so it is very helpful, but it is also just the beginning, right? It's just the beginning. It's kind of like The Secret. I remember when I was like 19 and I read The Secret and my mom was reading it. I'm like, what is this? The Secret is really helpful for people, but at the end of the day, there's a reason these people are still so unhappy and unfulfilled reading all of these books and not knowing what to do with any of the information. So definitely read it. Definitely check it out, Right? Lexi says, I had to read a passage of that book for my creative nonfiction degree, and my professor used it as an example of a memoir lacking substantial reflection, so the experts agree with Brittany. Well, it's really about what you get out of it, right? What do you gain from this? I read it, like I said, I've read it twice, and I read it twice because I wanted to see if I could get a tool from it. In my 20s, it gave me a tool. In my 30s, less so, right? So that's the question is, I reread books too. I want to go back and I want to reread Aristotle and Socrates and everybody and Plato because I was realizing as I, when I was 19, 20 reading those books, now I wonder how different they'll be to my brain. So I want to do it again, right? Um, I think it'll be interesting. Liv says, what books do you recommend? All of the books. I know this sounds like a non-answer, but if, but I think you should read the give it uh, the art of giving not giving a fuck. I think you should read everything. I think you should read the body keeps the score and the Quran and the Bible. I think you should read every single book so you can tell the difference between an introspective one on a certain spectrum, like a two spectrum, and an introspective book on a five spectrum. An inter a book that will give you a tool and what kind of writers and readers like you want to be, or what kind of a writer do you want to read, and what kind of a reader do you want to be. I think you should consume. And then recognize that sometimes the best thing to do is not consume, right? I think the problem is that people think if I just read the right book, if I just do the right thing, if I go to the right, it's not about the right books. It's about the right book for you, right? 
What books do you recommend that helped you recently? Mm, actually, well, I'll tell you the truth. I haven't read as recently, but I am currently reading The Body Keeps the Score because that lady called me out during Wix panel and I was like, girl, I'm gonna finish this book just so I can tell you that it's fine. And also I got a book re recommendation from Not So Erudite, Kyla, about the more academic version of The Body Keeps the Score. So I'm gonna read that next. And they're all audiobooks on Spotify. And I'm about to jump into other, basically I'm reading books for research purposes right now. I'm gonna read Determined, Robert Spolosky. Uh, I think that'll be interesting. So all of the books in regards to probably like my work, but also bobble hopping has been like really my focus, you know? Yeah. Um, what is a five level book? That's a great question. That's a great question. Oh, fun stuff. Cognitive. I don't know how to answer that question. Cognitive says rich dad, poor dad. Fun story. He's in a lot of debt and it was all fake. A story just came out about it. It was all bullshit. But it worked. He sold you the book, didn't he? To what he's saying. Justin, he's in. You ever seen the movie 48 Hours? Right now, he's having 48 hours with Diddy, him and his boy. Um, they're having the times of their lives, like, 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 the, you know, where we hanging out and what we doing. Um, we we can't really disclose, but um. Ooh, I love that you guys are asking me if I know any books about boundary setting and consent. I love that. One of my faults as a human is I don't remember anything, titles or books, movies, anime. Sometimes people are like, "Have you seen this?" And I'm like, "I don't think so." And then I watch it, and I'm like, "Oh, I've seen this." So I actually like either need to keep notes of everything I read and start making book lists, which is too exhausting. You know what I mean? What's the academic version of The Body Keeps the Score? It is called, hold on, let me look through my DMs with Kyla. It's called The Body Remembers, um, here I'll, let me, by Babette Rothschild. So I have that on my reading list. I will check that out. Apparently it is better and it is, on Spotify's audiobooks if you guys want to check it out. So I'm going to I'm finishing up the body keeps the score and then I'm going to go to that one and then I'm going to compare them. I'll probably make a podcast about it or something. Um just so I have all of the tools, you know what I mean? Jelly bean. Oh, Robert Kisaski. Okay, I'll check that out. And I love fiction as well. Like I've read tons of fiction in my life. So I definitely definitely love me some fiction. I'll keep this name down. Okay, okay, okay. Let's keep going. It's definitely a 15-year-old's dream. Um, you know, I, I, I have been given custody of... Ugh, this version of Justin Bieber was so sweet and innocent. You know, he yeah. signed to Usher. I'm signed to Usher. I, I, I had legal guardianship of Usher when, when you know, he, he did his first album. I did yes. Usher's first album. I don't really... I don't have legal guardianship of him, but for the next 48 hours... He's with me, so, um, and yeah, and, um, and, and, yeah, and we, and we gonna go full, buck full crazy. We're going crazy. I mean, you can't just sit there and tell me that this doesn't insinuate he was about to take advantage of Justin Bieber in some inappropriate way, most likely against his will. Again, Justin was 15 at the time. Justin has mentioned his connection with P. Diddy and- Oh, sorry, Balto. You said he wrote Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Oh, that's, that's Robert Kiyosaki. I don't want to say his name. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. I get it. I get it. Sorry. Every tool is a tool that might work for you. So read all the books. Like the body keeps the score is already fascinating to me, but I know some people make a cult around it. And that is the worry. Myers-Briggs, astrology, your mom, everyone can turn anything into a cult. And so if it's a cult, if you're obsessed, if you identify, if it's your Bible, maybe reconsider your relationship to it. Even the Bible isn't the Bible. So this idea that like, oh, if you like the body keeps a score, that means you're one of those culty ones. It's like the secret. People like make cults around the secret, the book. It's a book written by a man. I mean, y'all made a cult around the Bible. Hello. So like again, remember that a thing is just a, a shared work from another person and it's your decision to worship it or not. I don't even think you should worship God. And yet here we are in the past through Usher who had signed him. And now the mystery surrounding Sean Diddy Combs, better known by P. Diddy, persists as reports suggest that he has fled the country, you guys. Yeah, that's right. During the raids on his residences, Diddy was nowhere to be found at either of his locations. And his mm -hmm. current whereabouts... Obviously, he was tipped off. You know what Kanye called Diddy a fed. I wonder if Diddy got away with all of his bullshit all these years because he was working with the U.S. government. <laughs> 
deaths are completely unknown. It is now speculated that he has indeed left the U.S. in an attempt to evade authorities. Now, as I mentioned, the feds have raided P. Diddy's homes and have been looking for him due to the ongoing misconduct and investigation being done against him. There have been multiple allegations against the musician, including a suit from his ex-girlfriend Cassie and another one from music producer Rodney Lilrod Jones. Some fans have even monitored the flight path of what is believed to be P. Diddy's private jet, which recently touched down on the Caribbean island of Antigua. The New York Post reported on this, saying Diddy has seemingly disappeared and so has his jet. Around the same time as a raid on his houses in California and Florida on Monday, the rapper and record company mogul was spotted frantically talking on his phone at Opaloka Airport in Miami. It has since emerged one of Diddy's employees, Brendan Paul, 25, had just been stopped at the airport and arrested on charges by Miami-Dade police. Diddy, also known as Sean Combs, has not been spotted in public since. The rapper's private jet, with a distinctive all-black paint job, has also suspiciously vanished from public tracking site Flight Aware. So that's pretty interesting, might I add. Now, this video of both P. Diddy and Justin Bieber has been recirculating on social media since the allegations of him had come out, and they've been spreading all over social media, especially over on TikTok and Twitter. With users criticizing him and labeling him as creepy. Lots of people are even voicing their worries for Justin Bieber, suggesting that he might have endured distressing experiences as a child star and might explain why some of his fans think that he is traumatized and just looks so sad and depressed most of the time when he's out in public. There's even been anticipation that Justin Bieber is going to get raided next in an attempt to prevent him from speaking out against P. Diddy and his alleged experience with him when he was a minor. Check it out. There is going to be a lot of celebrity takedowns when it comes to the whole P. Diddy situation. A lot of people are saying Jay-Z is next. It seems like Diddy is going to make Justin his scapegoat. I'm sure many of you know Sloan Bella. She basically predicted this whole Diddy takedown investigation. Now Justin- I don't know if she predicted it because like we already knew things were happening years ago. You guys sent me, someone told me about that. Like, oh my gosh, this Sloan girl predicted it. Did she predict it 30 years ago? Because if she predicted it 10 or 15 or 20 or even 30 years ago, it's not that impressive. Everybody knew it was coming. It's just we didn't know what to do about it. So, like, did she predict it? And has a very weird relationship with Diddy. Something had happened because young Justin Bieber wasn't seen with Diddy for a while after that. Got my number, so. Justin's right, okay. so uncomfortable. Yeah, yeah. You're starting to act different, huh? You, no, you, no, ain't, no. you ain't been calling me and hanging out the way we used to hang out. Well, I mean, you haven't... You I mean, you try to get in contact with me, you know, through all my, you know, business, you know, partners and whatnot. Mm -hmm. But, mm. but you, you never really got my number, so. Right. Okay. My number? Yeah, yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm yeah. Tell you. During Justin's party era in 2015 and 2016, he tried to break out of the celebrity alight blackmailing. TMZ did a whole report on it, then redacted it. This is one of the only articles. Uh, Sloan has connections to the, the industry. Well, not much of a prediction then more of an inside information. Left up of the TMZ incident. Last year or two years ago, this article is stating that he became more active in a Bible study and allegedly shared a horrific story. The story goes along the lines of he was attending a party with producers, power agents, and a young boy had been brought to the party for the industry elite. And he was encouraged to, yeah, allegedly just- Now I wanna say this again. When we hear the, the buzzword elite, I want to just remind all these conservatives that keep saying all these elites, look at these horrible elites, look at your churches, look at yourselves. I don't trust anybody that points the finger on the quote other side without pointing a finger at themselves first and foremost. If I don't see you going after your churches with the same amount of energy you're going after these quote elites in Hollywood, I don't believe you care about children. It's not just happening in Hollywood. It is first and foremost happening in your backyard. But you see how what they do is, this is why pointing the finger, blame, and, and your, this is why it takes away your sense of responsibility. Because if you can distract yourself with other people's problems, you don't have to face yourself when it comes to yours. I am so sick of seeing these conservatives talk all about these elites. You're so worried about Pizzagate. You're so worried about children, but you're not focusing your attention on your churches. The one place you probably have the most power to help and you're not doing the work. Justin said, I didn't want to do this. I really didn't. They said this kid- Can you imagine if the good people in all of our communities 
just worked in our own communities trying to get rid of predators. But instead, we pay attention to other people's communities so we don't have to see the shit happening in our own fucking bedrooms. Rugged explaining that it was made clear to him that he would gain entry to the business side of the industry if he joined the club by passing the initiation right to join the club hold on i want to read this again i didn't want to do this i really didn't they said this kid was blank it was horrible explaining that it made bieber said explaining that it made was made clear to him that he would gain entry to the business side of the industry if he joined the club by passing the initiation rights men and women all these people why is it initiation cults like do things and you can get in the club i'm not gonna do shit i want to hang out with you i don't want to be friends with you call me antisocial all i want but if being social means this shit i'm out i don't want to be your friend i don't want to hang out with you i don't want it's amazing how people expect you to keep your mouth shut in order to stay in their good graces i don't want to play your game then I want to be a hermit, left alone, mind my business. Gain entry to the business side of the industry if he joined the club by passing the initiation right. To join the club, I had to do bad things to this poor kid. You know what I'm worried about? I am worried about Sneeko. I'm like, as a big sister feeling, I'm terrified for him. And I'm worried that he is doing this shit. I am. I am worried that he is doing this shit. Because it's all fun and games until you're at an initiation party. It's all fun and games. Until they try to convince you, don't you want to be a billionaire? It's all fun and games until you go to the next step. So how do you go from Andrew Huberman, who seduces and plays 4D chess with six women? How do you go from a destiny who neglects everybody around him for, quote, money and work and serial cheats on partners and admits that he'll do it again? How do you go from Sneeko, who cheats on women and admits he does it, irresponsible, absolutely gaslighting all of them? All of them are gaslighters. How do you go from cheating to sex trafficking? How do you go from cheating to being a victim in the industry? How do you go from shaking people's hands and rubbing like, how do you go, okay, from being what you think is no big deal, I'm just a cheater. How do you go from being a kid to being put into a situation where you gotta do the initiation? I almost trust the antisocial people more. Because they're not busy doing this kind of shit. But the question is, how do you go from being a guy who just thinks, oh, I'm a cheater, to this bullshit? How do you do it? Seisha's, have you ever had experiences like this in the YouTube sphere? That's a great question. <sighs> I've had situations where... Um... I've had situations where it became clear that they expected you to let things go because everyone was doing it or to let things slide because it wasn't that big of a deal. Or I've had situations where people expected you to normalize neglect in order to get collab or make things happen. I've never dealt with anyone that was sex trafficking. I've never dealt with anyone uh, that was like bringing in people under 16. A lot of people make leeways for 16, 17, 18. A lot of people are definitely fucking with high schoolers in a way that I'm like, I'm out. I've never dealt with anybody that was um, that – uh, brought money into it in a really blunt way. It'd be more like, hey, I can get you deals if you want to work with us, which sounds innocent enough, but it's at the expense of never opening your mouth and never mentioning anything and always saying good things about people in public. Right? Now, keep in mind, and I just want to relate this to something that seems casual, but if I'm on the internet and we have a disagreement, right? And the disagreement isn't allowed because the bubble wants absolutely no disagreement. And the threat is if you disagree and you say your opinion, but it makes people feel like you betrayed them, then that is a form in my mind of controlling the narrative in a way that I think is super unethical. But that's why I blocked all those people that were interested in trying to cause bullshit drama between people because that's a part of the narrative. 
oh, as friends, you can't disagree because that means you're talking bad about your friend online, which is a way to control the narrative. But that's why I respect people in the space that can disagree with me in public because it means they're not trying to control the narrative. But people are really eager to be a part of clicks, and so they're willing to help control the narrative. And that is why I don't want to be part of your group hangout sessions, bros. I'm good, bro. I have friends. I'm good. And those friends better be ready for me to criticize them in public if they open their big fat mouths. Because I'm allowed to have different opinions than you. That's a way to control the narrative. That's what family members do. It's what friends do. It's what teachers do. Don't say anything. Oh, I'll be uncomfortable. Oh my gosh, don't do this. It will... And I was. My mom said I've always been this way. She said I'm always the girl who says things whether it makes people uncomfortable. Could be my autism if I have it. <laughs> I just feel like I need to be able to sleep at night. Okay? So it's about me. I just... I hold myself accountable through my own values and I feel like... Mm, I don't like the way this is going down. You feel me? But then I realized that wasn't enough for them. I'd also have to unalive this little child. You can read the rest. Now Sloan argued. I want to know where this came from, right? He's saying he had to unalive this little child as a part of a ritual. Like, I want to know where this came from. And it could be just like gang initiation, right? Lots of gang initiation involves like killing people to like join the gang. So is he saying that P. Diddy was running, you know what I mean? And the sources, what, the sources have been confirmed, similar rituals when you look at Bohemian Grove in L.A., which Alex Jones actually uncovered several years ago. It's like, look, this is normal gang activity. This is normal people activity in terms of expected behavior with organized criminals in gangs. They want to get you dirty so you don't turn them in. It's a, it's a ta Initiations are tactics to sully your reputation in hands. So you literally don't have the right to speak out against anyone. So everyone looks at you and goes, yeah, but you participated, which is true. So if you speak out, you're fucked by two sides of the coin, the group you're betraying and the group that doesn't want to embrace you because you participated in the shittery. I'd also have to unalive this little child. You can read the rest. Now Sloan argues that Diddy is going to make Justin the scapegoat next because he's not ready to take down Jay-Z who has a whole group behind him. Oh, I guarantee you jay Z's dirty. I guarantee you, I guarantee you. Instead, this story is going to get pinned on Justin. I pray that it doesn't as it seems Justin was a victim. This is just a prediction from someone else who has predicted correct things about celebrity elites. This picking investigation against Diddy is just one of several legal battles the music executive is currently facing. It all started when his ex-girlfriend of 11 years, Cassie, sued him for rape and decades long physical abuse last year. She called him out for years of depraved conduct, including forcing her into a reliant and sexually abusive lifestyle. Less than 24 hours after she filed the lawsuit, Diddy settled it out of court. However, her suit opened the way for many other victims to accuse the rapper of repeated sexual assault. Diddy is now at the receiving end of Where do you think he is? Like, that's what I want to know. Where is Diddy right now? I want to know who's protecting him, who is, who, who is he spending time with? What's happening? Lawsuits, including one from music producer Rodney Lil Rod Jones. Jones, who used to work as a producer and videographer for Diddy, accused the business mogul of repeatedly assisting him during the production process for his last album, the Love Album Off the Grid. According to NBC News, Jones claimed that Diddy used to grow his private part to groom him for and other activities if this is true this is just so effing gross and disturbing oh is beyonce dirty too i hate to say it we all know okay this is so crazy but we all know nikki knows because nikki's involved with meek or was and meek involved in diddy okay and they've all made songs about it and i knew because when shit happened with nikki and meek mills like forever ago i was like mm -hmm, what are they talking about okay so I know Nikki knows. I know Nikki knows Beyonce. And I know Beyonce, I know Jay-Z and Diddy hang out because they're all black billionaires. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. And I mean, the fact that it's being reported, there's multiple allegations against him. The fact that it's being mm -hmm. reported that he is. Mm -hmm. Now, did you see the conspiracy theories that might be right or not? From the Matt Walsh's of Twitter. Matt Walsh is so obnoxious. I don't trust anything he tweets because it's always wrong. But he's claiming that even Taylor Swift, apparently he has a video about Taylor Swift, right? 
I'm ready for 2024 to take down everybody. I don't know if Taylor's actually involved in anything, but I know her dad and allegedly the men in her life have definitely been involved in bullshit. So I'm curious about that allegedly. Not in his residences, both of them at that, during the time of the feds looking for him and raiding his homes. I mean, it just all seems very sketchy and there just has to be something. Oh yeah, Chrissy says Dubai maybe. Maybe he is in Dubai. Look, Beyonce's performance in Dubai was like amazing, right? Isn't that where she performed that amazing like, ah, it was so good. I think about that and I'm like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It's interesting. Again, what will you do for success? Like, what will you do for that thing? And again, just in my, look, guys, everything that's happening in the little ways in your life, expand it bigger for the people at the top. So your life is their life, but at the very bottom. So think about the drama. You work at Starbucks. Think about the drama working at Starbucks. Now amplify it to the music industry and there's a whole lot of fuckery happening, right? Think about the drama you have at your school lunchroom. Think about the drama you have at your local like church. Think about the drama you had at college. Now amplify that to jets, billionaires, cocaine, and hookers. Okay, poor people got hookers too. Rich people got hookers. It's just the poor people version of the rich people's game and vice versa. Okay? You know what I mean? So again, when we're like thinking about like what does their life look like? Poor people are doing the same game. They're just playing with different stakes. Rich people are doing the same game. They're just playing with different stakes. And then the question is, do you want to be a part of those categories? Because I don't want to be a part of those categories. So I exit. Nope. I don't want to sell drugs illegally. I don't want to do things, you know, against the law that's going to put me in prison for 20 years. I don't want to do anything crazy. I don't want to sell people. Okay. Whether I'm poor or rich, I don't want to put people's like consent on the line, rich or poor. I'm trying to really stay within my values. Now it's a little tricky because the nuance comes in, because even if you're in a pretty well-adjusted bubble, not the rich, rich fame and not the poor, 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 who's all doing very illegal stuff, gangs and all that stuff. Okay, those people out. Then you have kind of the normie bubbles. Let's call them that. And then you have your own set of nuance and drama and issues and corruption that's usually centered around childhood trauma or generational curses. Then you got to make that decision. Okay, am I going to be the person that ditches my kids the way my father ditched me? Am I going to be the mother that doesn't say anything when she notices her husband is going a little too far with the kids? Am I going to be the sibling that lets my siblings take the fall for something that I know I did? Am I going to be this? You have to decide who you are in the anime and what are you going to do? Right? So even inside of a quote, 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 like kind of normie, healthy, adjusted bubble-ish, there's always going to be the temptation for dealing with your own version of issues. And then you got to decide, okay, what do I do? Now, obviously we're all born into bubbles and we don't have a choice. We're all born into bodies that have, you know, all these like bubble expectations of them, our gender, our race, and all that stuff is chosen for us when we're initially born. And then we learn to have different relationships with those things as we age. How much of this matters? How much of it matters to me? How much of it is about the perception? And then we have to have those battles. You know? I don't know if you can hear my cat. She's meow meowing outside my door. But I, I'm not. I'm okay. I can't get up right now. I can't get up. So you know what I mean? You have to ask yourself, like, what am I going to do? And again, I just want you to hold yourself accountable, not anybody else. I don't want you to blame anybody else. I don't want other people to hold you accountable. I just want you to hold yourself accountable. Okay? And it's by the values and morals you set for yourself. Mammoths! No! No! She's just going to make my allergies worse, bros. She's going to make my allergies worse. <laughs> going on behind the scenes and something more dark and sinister into p diddy's lifestyle and his life choices that have led up to him being involved in these suits and homeland security on the hunt for him so over on twitter here's what many people have to say this video is so sad but explains a lot about who justin is now explains justin in Good. which way traumatized this is just sick it seems like justin bieber has some skeletons he may need to divulge and may explain some of his behaviors the Biebs look nervous. Who was protecting this young boy? His body language says a lot. Now the public knows why Justin Bieber went a little squirrely in his early 20s. When now, this is an assumption we're all making. I think it's a pretty accurate assumption. You know, truthfully, the same with um, Amanda Bynes. I really feel for Amanda Bynes, bro. I really want so much better for her. Like, you don't just change like that. 
for no reason. Like you don't just change. Orlando Brown, like you don't just change like that for no reason. Even Raven Simone, I want to know what she knows. Because you know Raven knows something, bro. You know, you know, victim of PTSD. This clip of P. Diddy, 40, and Justin Bieber, 15, has been going viral along with a clip of Diddy asking a 17-year-old Justin Bieber why he doesn't want to hang out with him anymore. It was hard for me being that young and being in the industry and not knowing where to turn and everyone, you know, telling me they love me and, you know, just turn their back on you in a second. Red flag, when adults say they're your friends. When adults say they love and will protect you, when they say, oh, I'm so happy to mentor you, be weary of adults who want to spend time with your kids, period, period. I don't care who they are. Be aware that they could be the next person who's going to harm your children. And he was told, we love you. You're so beautiful, Justin. Wow, Justin, I really love you, Justin. I'm going to protect you, Justin. Second, um, so... Yeah. It's super creepy seeing all these videos of Diddy that's coming out, but what's really concerning is Diddy might be just the tip of the iceberg. How many more Diddies are still protected in the industry? Sure. How many more kids have been Anyways, you guys, I definitely want to know your take on this whole situation. Definitely let me know your thoughts on everything that is coming out about P. Diddy in the comments down below. And also, also what you thought of the clip of him and Justin Bieber. Okay, I want to try to find this clip here. Because I am really curious about, uh, I hate that they don't link their sources in the video. This is fine. Justin Bieber talking about the industry. That's what I'm saying. Like, I know everyone thinks like being famous sounds amazing. I know everyone's like, this just sounds so cool. This sounds great. But does it? Does it? Does it? I'm just you know, does it? I wonder if there's like timestamps fascinated by the human condition of making music and art. You hit it on the head with the human condition and creating art. I'm, I'm with you there. So we're... Well, it's great to see you, man. Congratulations yeah, on completing you. the music. Thank you. Appreciate that. It's exciting. I mean, it's such a tasteful sounding record. And Appreciate that. Just the arrangements. And, I mean, talk about giving you space to, to perform and just extend your vocal ability which everyone already knows it's like you're the best at what you do but justin has like one of the saddest auras i've ever seen in my life not that i read auras but you know what i'm saying like the energy he's just so sad and disassociated and i do i like i think that is why he's so wounded as a person thank you sounds so effortless i don't know it just sounds like you're in a super comfortable place vocally on this record i appreciate that yeah i'm getting into like i was just i mean we can wait you want to wait to to get this on camera so interesting i just feel like i mean we're recording right are we recording i'd rather just start yeah i don't too. really have a big introduction yeah cool i like that i like that like you said i, I feel like i'm in a cool vein but i haven't really this album is super uh it's just not very deep, you know? Yeah, I didn't go I didn't go there like that, you know what I mean? I didn't go super deep with it. Uh, thank you. The last two or three years which have led up to this album, there's been some really significant change in your life and the album being called Changes focuses on one mm -hmm. and we're gonna get to a place of, of happiness and this album is a happy album. I mean, mm -hmm. it's really, you know, it's, it's it feels to me like a... Is Justin Bieber neurodivergent? Is this ADHD? What is this? A musical tribute to your relationship. Is this anxiety? Is this CPTSD? What is this? But I want to kind of kick the timeline off in 2017, and I, I always feel like there's a point with you, Justin, where you give so much, then you've you've got to a point where you've got to stop. Mm -hmm. But it's like the train is running, you know what mm -hmm. I mean? So it has to stop in a dramatic fashion. Mm -hmm. Why did you stop the tour in 2017, and and what was the reason for that? Uh, I was really tired emotionally, physically. And I was sick, and I didn't realize I was sick. So I had like uh, Epstein Barr, which is like it's called mono. Mm. Uh, and then I have Lyme disease. So it was that. It was it was just. Oh, I forgot he's chronically ill like that. Yeah. You know the exhaustion of just being on tour, and then it was like, it was just everything compounded. I think to be honest. How did you feel when the tour came to an end? 
I mean, it, it didn't. Wow, both of you at the same same time said it looks like self soothing. Mm -hmm. Really come to an end. I was supposed to do a bunch of stadiums, but uh, you know, I, once the American lag or the European lag or wherever I came from last was done, I was like, this is it for me. I mean, I pushed through, you know, the pat the last mm. month or two, and I, you know, I couldn't believe I pushed through that. So when they were like, you know, we got to still do stadiums, I was like. This is not going to be good. I'm not going to be able to make it through that. And it's just, no, it won't work. And I'm someone who pushes, pushes, pushes until it's like, you know, mm. until it's like the last straw. So I, I just couldn't do it. You knew instinctively that your, something was going on in, with your physical Yeah, strength. I knew there was something not right because I was doing everything right on tour. I mean, I wasn't, you know, I was keeping them up. It's interesting that he doesn't make eye contact either. I almost really want to watch this, this with you guys, but it is 43 minutes, so I think that's probably not the thing we should watch right now. But I will link this in case anyone wants to watch it because I think his body language is interesting. I almost want to forward it a bit. Hold on. You know, you know, I you'd hear this and I and it would just be, why am I feeling? Why are you making me feel bad for doing something? Like, obviously, there's like a form of like we should, we got to make sure we keep our kids accountable and punish our kids so that they learn from their mistakes. Okay, hold on. What was the turning point for you? I think it was my perception of who Jesus really was, you know? What? Hold on. You know, when it says following Jesus is actually turning away from sin, mm. and so there's no what, what it talks about. With that being said, she went out and did things that hurt me, and so it was just this hurt. I've hurt her, she hurt me. And then uh, before tour, we just really stopped talking. I was really upset. And uh, rather than, you know, before that, in my uh, previous relationship, I went off and just went crazy and went wild, just was, you know, being reckless. This time I took the time to like really build myself um, and focus on, you know, me and uh, try to make the right decisions and all that sort of stuff. And, yeah, I got better. And so she would reach out to people that would like, that we knew. Check in on you. And check in and she would get like these, the, you'd hear, right? You'd hear like, oh, he's doing so well. And she would be so pissed off because she's like, he's not doing well without me. Like just, you know, normal. Is he talking about his wife or his mom? Normal like, right? Like normal. Facts. Yeah. Right? <laughs> and. Yeah. Yeah. And so, uh, it sucks to hear you're happy without you. Is that her? Is that um, what's her name? You'd hear this, right? You'd hear this, and I and it would just be, you'd just be like, what? He's doing well, like. But in a way, you're kind of trying to get better because you recognize there's something that is unresolved here. That in a weird way, I'm right. 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 Mm -hmm. Right. I just didn't know what the heck was going on, and so I really took a deep dive in my faith. To be honest, I just went deep into like. I believed in Jesus, but I never really like, you know, when it says following Jesus is actually turning away from sin. Mm. And so there's no, what, what it talks about in the Bible, it's like there's no obedience. There's no faith without obedience. So it's like I had had faith about like, oh, I believe Jesus died on the cross for me, but I never really implemented it mm. into my life. I never like was like, I'm going to be obedient. Um, so I was like, I wasn't sleeping around. I wasn't doing a lot of stuff. I just was kind of by myself. And how did you how did you make who helped you come to that? Because I'm sure there are a lot of, and I don't mean this in a judgmental way, it's just right. humanity and everyone's on their own journey. There are a lot of people who are practicing one belief or another, but as you say, it's different when you when you say it as opposed to actually acting within its right. its 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 guidelines, which are there right. to give you ultimate focus, right? Mm -hmm. On what's important. So when did you decide to actually move within the guidelines and how did you find yourself away from, yeah, I believe in Jesus, but I'm gonna drink or do drugs or sleep around or what all these other distractions. Right. How did you get out of that world? What was the turning point for you? I think it was my perception of who Jesus really was, mm. you know? Um, I'd had really bad examples. It is interesting how people turn to Christ or religion when they're in like a really, really tough place. And I think there's something really beautiful about humans as a species because we turn to like a code of conduct. We really do turn to some sort of like teacher or consistency to give us some sort of place to put ourselves. And so I do think it's interesting when people end up going back to religion, 
and what religion gives them, what kind of stability religion gives them. I think that is very interesting to me. I couldn't, I never needed, I didn't turn back to religion. I know a lot of people thought maybe, oh, she'd come back to Catholicism. I turned to philosophy, but I also turned to letting go of that attachment. I felt like I just practiced letting go of needing sort of that community and structure. And I formed my own little relationship with myself and how I feel about the world. And then I was lucky enough to find a person that I could also share that with, which is really great. But it's interesting how many people turn to Christ or religion or formalize something. It's interesting. Yeah, I feel like I just let go of all of that attachment. Uh, because for me, like, I just feel like we don't know if there's a God or anything. So I couldn't imagine turning to something that I just don't. I don't have that kind of belief. I don't believe in astrology. I don't believe in magic. I don't believe in God. I don't believe in anything. Like, I have no reason to believe in those things. Now, believing in something is great. But it's too big of a thing for me to believe in without some sort of evidence. So I'd rather just know if they're real and then do it that way uh, personally. But I think that the faith people have that belief is strong enough that – and it's good enough that it's what they rely on, which is fine, right? Um, and that's what belief is. Belief is having that faith without that evidence. And I think that's fine. Of Christians in my life uh, who would say one thing and do another. So they were the, my direct example of who Jesus was. That's mm -hmm. why you didn't take it seriously. I didn't take it as seriously because I didn't have a good example. Good role models. Yeah. And so I think the more I, I really just really looked at the character of who Jesus really was. Did you grow up in a, in a, in a, in a Christian household? I grew up um, in a in a Christian household, yeah. But my mom was, um, I mean, she was really hurt growing up. I mean, she had so many mm -hmm. things going on in her life. So she was navigating her faith journey. For me, it was just confusing because she'd say one thing and then like she would say, well, you're forgiven, but then I'd do something bad or whatever was supposedly bad, but then I'd, she'd make me feel ashamed for it. So it's like, well, if Jesus forgives me, then why am I feeling why are you making me feel bad for doing something? Like, obviously there's like a form of like, we should, we gotta make sure we keep our kids accountable and punish our kids so that they learn. Punishment doesn't work. I will say, I think this is why I, I, I say like, if you're gonna have a relationship with anyone, it should be yourself. Cause it doesn't involve other people. No one can ruin myself for me. Only I can ruin the relationship with myself for me. No one has that. You know, my parents, I see you guys in the comments sharing that like, oh, your parents kind of like ruined your relationship with religion. My parents can't ruin, ruin my relationship with me because they're not involved. It's, they're not in the conversation anymore. I'm an adult. That's the greatest part about being an adult. No one needs to be involved in the relationship you have with yourself uh, because now you have the agency to have that relationship. I think sometimes kids can manage it, but it's harder. And so that relationship I have with myself can't be ruined because nobody knows me like I know me, right? And ultimately, I think that that is a type of like meditative practice or like focus about the consciousness that other people usually externalize out. I'm very internally motivated. Some of you might be externally motivated. So you need that external validation or external sort of like looking to, right? Um, I think probably because I'm in the category, which many of you probably are, of internalizing a lot of myself, it's a conversation between me and me. And I noticed that my borderline was the worst. My life was the worst when I was internalizing too much of the external and didn't know where to put it within my inner consciousness because it never belonged there in the first place. Even my husband, who I love so much, like he is he and I am me and we are not each other. And we are here to do life with one another, but he is on his own journey and I'm on my own journey. And we're lucky that we're doing our journey together, but we are still doing our own, we have our own relationship with ourselves. I do not have the same relationship with his consciousness that he has with his own consciousness. Because that relationship is sacred between him and him. And then I have my relationship with myself and then we share with one another that relationship that we formed between our two two selves, right? <laughs> Day says, so you're in a relationship with yourself and a spouse, so you're still polyamorous? Kidding. Yeah, cute. We are very polyamorous between me, him, him, and I. 
I think that's interesting when you have a relationship with something external and then you kind of learn about that externality or external thing through other parts of external, like existing is the relationship you have with yourself and existence is the relationship outside of yourself. So Justin is having a complicated relationship with two parts of existence, his mom and his religion. So it's interesting, right? Sense of rest says I yearn for community and so I sometimes fixate on other others' perceptions of me, not for self-worth, but to feel like I belong, I hate it. Hey, I think that's the journey, figuring out in terms of categorization, are you a community person or are you a singular person? You know, I always thought I was a community person. And don't let me project this onto you, but I really spent my whole life looking for my community only to realize I never was a community person. I'm a really good star guest. I love guesting in other people's bubbles. I love coming in as the star friend. I love visiting. I love bringing gifts and food and Auntie Brittany's coming to town. So, you know, she's going to, you know, it's going to be fun. And I love showing up at my friends like community efforts, but I don't want to be belong. Like, I don't want to belong to a community. I never quite fit in. Even with my own community on Discord, I love them so much. But even I had to remind them that like, oh, like I need to have boundaries with how much time I spend here because I love it here. But also like I disappear at times because being a community member means showing up. And though I'm a community member, uh, I'm a part-time community member, I need to be able to go off on my own adventures. I'm kind of nomadic that way. Like I really do want to express love to my community online, my love to my family and friends, and still be able to pick up and go and venture off. And that venturing off is not conducive with being part of a community. Like people who are part of their communities, I mean, there's different variations as a spectrum, but I'm thinking about the community member I thought I used to be or want to be, which was like there every day, there every week, consistent, people could rely on me. I'd be here in 10 years. I want to be able to pick up and go, girl. And being able to pick up and go is a very different bubble than the community person. Community people are great. Community people are so necessary. But if you force yourself into that community role, I do think it eats at you. And if you force yourself to be nomadic when you're not, see, I'm nomadic, but I'm not a traveler. So people hear me say I'm not a community member and I'm not and I'm nomadic. So they think I'm a traveler. I do not want to travel. Like I do not love traveling into different bubbles as like my hobby. Right. I want to be stationary, but I want to travel in my mind. I want to research. I'm a researcher. I'm not a traveler. Like I'm open to traveling, but it also takes too many spoons and I don't want, I like the consistency of being able to learn as I'm, I'm a student. I'm going to be a chronic student my whole life. Right. But that's different than a, like a nomadic traveler who like gets out of the house and goes to different countries and is in a different place all the time, has a million stamps in their passport. That's not me, girl. I just want to observe and like contemplate and take in information at all times. That's my little like hyper focus. Ah uh, says, I love your outlook on that because I've always felt the need to be around people. But I think in more of a, hey, I'm visiting person recently. I have realized I like being alone and that was huge for me. It's huge, right? March says, are you talking about physical travel? Yeah, like physical travel. You know, like people are physical travelers and then there's people that are like learners. Like people physically travel and never bother being introspective or learning. Some people just travel from town to town to drink at the best bars, right? But I want to travel in more of a bubble way, but less like a backpacking nomad and more like in a learning way. Because there are people, my mom has read way more books than I've ever read. She's read thousands of thousands of that. My mom's probably read like 10,000 books at this point. I don't even know how much. They've always been the same category of book, religious books and Catholic books. She's always read like religious or fictional books related to sort of like philosophy. So she's read a lot of philosophy books. She's read like a lot of modern philosophy books. But my mom has never like as a student, popped a bubble and read a book about a sex worker or popped a bubble and like jumped into a different bubble that's like not adjacent to the things that are safe for her. I want to pop a bubble as a student, like I want to nomadically, intellectually travel like a student. Does that make sense? And then I want to like meet people who are living in those bubbles and be like, tell me about that bubble. What's that like? What's your life like? Is it working? What does working mean? Is it healthy? Do you think it's good? You know what I mean? That's why I make so many connections on the internet, I think. 
Because I'm like, tell me about that. I want to know more about how you live your life without needing to like physically take a plane 15 hours away into a country and like go do it myself. I just want, tell me about it. Does that make sense? Learn from their mistakes, but like if there's this God named Jesus who died for our sins so that we don't have to live in shame, then why? It was just things like that that would make me really question like, who is this Jesus guy? And I didn't really take a deep look into who he was. That's know? tough. I mean, I get it. Like this, hey man, our parents do the best they can. Mm -hmm. And I've been through my own, you know, situations where yeah. I've confronted the things that have affected my life's choices. Exactly. But at some point you got to come to a decision. You got to take responsibility for your own perception of those mm -hmm. situations, right? Yeah. Otherwise you run around just blaming everybody and that's an entitled situation, right? Yeah, so mm -hmm. good. It entitles you to- It is an entitlement situation to blame people. Because then you never take responsibility. Behave however you want. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Okay, we're going to stop it there because I think that's interesting. Um, <laughs> Brittany is basically Jane Goodall of People's Bubbles just watching from the bushes. And and um, yes, actually, yeah. I just want to observe. And then, you know, usually people ask me to get involved. I'm like, you don't want me to get involved because I'll just poke all the holes in what I think your bubble is doing wrong because I'm that person. Um... Do you have any advice on how to be more introspective and mindful as a young person? Well, first and foremost, I think you're already doing it. You're like you're reading and exploring and watching uh, streams and like popping bubbles naturally, right? I think you're already doing it. You're asking like a really good question. But I think like being an active student is the best thing possible, not in like a college setting because that's a bubble in and of itself, but in the sense that recognizing like, okay, people really live differently than me. What does that mean? You know? Um, I had a caller who asked me, great question. They said, how do you know if someone likes you? And I said, in what way? They said, uh, like, like, like you, like you. And I said, in what way? And they said, what do you mean? How many ways could there be? And I was like, well, do they like you for a one night stand? Do they like you for a short term relationship? Do they like you in a sense that they want to introduce you to their parents? Do they like you for marriage? Do they like you enough to have babies with you, but not be with you? When people come up to you and they say, hey, I really like you. Cool. In which way? And people go, what do you mean? And lots of people don't even know. They don't know in which way they like you. Often when people come up to you and say they like you, they usually mean like physically. Or maybe if they know your YouTube channel, they might say, hey, I really like you. Or the version of you that lives in my head from consuming your content. And then it's your job to decide in that moment, how do I become more introspective about this? What does it mean to me that someone said I like you? Does that change how I act around them? Should I give them the time of day? Does that mean I have to like them back? There's this uh, assumption that if somebody's interested in you, you should explore it to see where it goes. Why? Or there's this idea of like, if you like someone, you should tell them. Why? Well, because it insinuates some sort of like, if I like someone, that must mean we need to be deeper or more connected or have something in common or interact. And I think that obligation of, well, that's what that means is something that I personally am practicing not assuming that just because I like you means we have to hang out or be friends. Or just because I like you or even love you means we have to be together. I feel like n everything's a construct. And this thing that says like, well, that's the next step is an assumption based off of a construct that I can engage with or do something different with. So how do you be more introspective as a young person? Ask yourself why. Every time someone says like, this is how things are, why? Every time you want to do something, why? Discord says, <laughs> quote, watch more streams, Mark Cuban gif, taking notes. You know, my favorite thing to do is go on YouTube and watch, there's a tab that says new to you. And I like to click on it and see what it shows me. We're streaming now and I like to click on it. I'll go to Twitch sometimes and go to any of the categories and then I'll just like start clicking on people and I'm like, what are they going to teach me? I'll go to Chatterbait and click on different girls or boys. And I'm like, what is this going to teach me? I'll just go to different things and I'll click on something. I'm like, what am I going to learn from this? That's how I end up finding like different religious bubbles too. Cause I'm like, what bubble is this? And I'll like click on it. And all of a sudden I'm watching some guy in the middle of nowhere, like meditating. And I'm like, I don't know what this is. And I'll just watch on TikTok. I'll come across live streams and I'll just stop on them. And, and my husband is like, what are you watching? I'm like, I have no idea. And I'll just sit there and I'll watch. And I'm like, okay. The idea is that there's so many, there's so many lives being lived 
And I just want to know how many of them I get to observe and learn from before I die, but mostly to help me with myself. You see how all of this is really just about us? Just trying to figure it out for us. So let's close up this Diddy conversation, this Justin Bieber conversation. What does Diddy have to do with us? Everything and nothing. Every day, all of us make decisions to be more and more like Diddy or to be less and less like him. And anything that brings me closer to Diddy, I want to avoid doing. Anything that makes me further from Diddy, that's my goal. So sometimes if you need a reminder of what you do want to be, but you don't know how to phrase it, think about what you don't want to be. I don't want to be Diddy. I don't want to be Andrew Tate. I don't want to be Andrew Huberman. I don't want to be any of these fucking people that are willing to throw everyone under the bus for their own self-satisfaction while still being a person that is having a focused relationship with her consciousness. And as an adult, I am living how I want and doing what I want, but not at the expense of innocent people, not in a direct way. I know indirectly, we always contribute to the harm in the world. It's just the reality of life. But directly, I would like to be able to go to bed at night and say, okay, today I did not directly cause undue and unnecessary pain onto another person in a way that could have been avoided. I want to avoid as much harm making as possible while, ex while acknowledging that life will have its natural harm and sacrificing and suffering and all of that stuff. You know? So if you notice yourself one step closer to P. Diddy, maybe turn around and, and go left. Maybe choose a different direction. Maybe do anything else. And if you notice people making decisions that get them one step closer to Diddy, you know, maybe say goodbye to those people too. Or maybe just take note of it.